So again, it's a great honor to be here. It's uh, always amazing to come to Lisbon, especially to the uh, machine learning school. But let me get on with my talk because I have a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, this talk is in three parts. We're going to be, uh, you're, you're, you have probably gone through a lot on deep neural networks already. You're going to be going through a lot more in the coming days. So I have absolutely no reason to be teaching you anything about how to work with neural networks, how to train neural networks, how to develop models. Uh, your other instructors and your workshops will teach you all of that. What I am going to look at is something slightly offbeat. Try to understand, try to look at it from the perspective of why these things work. And uh, several of you possibly know all of this already. And to at least some of you, some of these things will be surprising, I hope. But actually, let me, let, let me introduce myself. That there, that's, that's, I always look like that for some reason. Uh, I'm a full professor in the Language Technologies Institute uh, with affiliations to the Machine Learning Department, Electrical and Computer Engineering, and uh, Music Tech. Uh, I work, as Isabel said, on various aspects of speech and audio processing, machine learning, and, uh, and related areas. So let me get on with my talk. The talk is in three parts. The first part, what is a neural network? We will look at a brief historical perspective. Those of you who were there, who were at my talk last year will recognize this in its entirety. Uh, the second part is what can neural networks model? Again, several of you will recognize this if you've been here last year. This portion, the third one, what do they actually learn? That's, uh, uh, that's an addition on top of what we had last year. Now, these are not exactly the same slides as last year, but if you do, so even if you did see them, there, there must be some uh, new topics. So here's the first part. What is a neural network? And well, point is, neural networks have suddenly taken over the business of AI. They've become one of the major thrust areas in various pattern recognition, prediction, and analysis problems and they have established the state of the art in so many problems that it's uh, that uh, these days when you speak of AI, you're really speaking of deep neural networks. Speech recognition. A few years ago, Microsoft declared that their automatic speech recognition systems based on deep neural networks had outperformed human beings. When they made this uh, announcement, they were probably exaggerating a bit. But I think at this point of time, it's fair to say that this is true. Uh, machine translation. If you used Google Translate in October 2015 and you typed something in English, translated it to Portuguese, put the Portuguese back in and translated back to English, what went in and what came out would be completely different and what came out would usually be meaningless. Uh, in November 2015, that changed. Suddenly, these machine translation systems became very useful and that was because Google switched from using uh, statistical models to neural network based models. So they're really good. Again, and they establish the benchmarks. Uh, image processing. Well, I'm not really sure where this picture came from. I got it from the web, so it must be true. But uh, in this uh, example, you can see that a uh, convolutional neural network is supposedly able to identify every single object in the image and label it. And uh, even if this is not entirely true, you can get pretty close to this performance on images. Again, this is pretty astonishing. Games. Uh, till about three years ago, it was assumed that Go was the uh, ultimate challenge in artificial intelligence. These days, you can download a neural network program from the web on your computer, and in a few, few hours, it will teach itself to play Go, and then it can beat the world champion. So these things have become amazingly good. Again, deep neural networks. Image captioning, this is an old, old slide. And uh, you can't really see this, but trust me, that even four years ago, uh, neural networks were able to actually attach captions to these images very accurately. So this one says, uh, girl, even I can't read it, black, job, or black dog jumps over a bar. So each of these captions is actually very accurate. And once again, neural networks are able to do this job. And, and a variety of other problems like image analysis, uh, like uh, natural language, uh, various problems in natural language processing that you're probably working with already, speech processing, even predicting stock markets. These days, 
uh, of all of the hedge funds and the uh, investment banks are using neural networks to make predictions. And of course, from your perspective, this is the most important piece. That a few years ago, learning all about neural networks was kind of an additional line on your resume. These days, if you don't learn about neural networks, you're not going to get a job. So, uh, in fact, this has kind of become not so true because the being able to work with uh, neural networks has become some somewhat of a baseline requirement if you're looking at any machine learning or uh, uh, AI based uh, or even any odd CS based job. So, what are these things? What are these neural networks? In each case, you have this magic box, something we are calling a neural network, some data goes in, like a voice signal, maybe you edit, something else comes out, a transcription, an image goes in, a text caption goes out, a game state goes in, the next game move comes out. Each of these is being performed by some box. What, what the heck? I have a desperate student trying to get in touch with me. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so what are these boxes? And the thing to discover, realize over here is that all of these tasks we were looking at are basically human tasks powered by the human brain. Speech recognition, that's something only humans do. We're playing the kind of games that we just saw, something that we do, you know, attaching captions to images, it's something we do. So to understand exactly how we do this, perhaps it makes sense to begin looking at how the brain works or even more fundamentally, you know, what is this business of cognition? How does cognition work? Now, this one is, I like to use this as a picture for an, a, a, a mnemonic for cognition. This is the thinker, thinker by Augustine Rodin, someone thinking. Thinking, of course, is a very human uh, operation and for those of you who don't know who, uh, who was actually being depicted here, that was supposed to be Dante. Anyway, here are all the things that humans can do. We can learn, we can solve problems, we can recognize patterns, we can uh, create, we can think, we can just, you know, you can just go and have a shower and have, think completely aimlessly and come out and have a brilliant idea that becomes an algorithm. So all of these things are amazing things that we do within our head. And perhaps these things are worthy of emulation. But then to emulate the, this, we have to know how humans work. And this is not just a question that I came up with. Uh, this has been a question that people have been worrying about for a long time and we don't have an answer. And most likely we will never have an answer. As Marvin Minsky says, if the brain was simple enough to be understood, we'd be far too simple to understand it. But that doesn't stop us from trying. And hasn't stopped people from trying for many, 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 many years goes back to about 400 BC where we have the first written reports of people trying to understand cognition. And the earliest models were something called associationism. They, all of the early models for how human cognition worked was based on the idea that uh, people learn to associate different things and then when we come up, when we perform our various tasks, whatever they are, we draw upon these associations to, to perform these tasks. This theory remained for a very long time, from 400 BC when it was first recorded by Plato. This is the school of Athens, it's supposed to be Socrates, I think that's Plato, right? Uh, and, you know, David Hume in the 18th century, all the way down to Ivan Pavlov in the early 20th century, all of these people continue to work on the hypothesis that cognition is based on association. And what are these associations? Things like these. Uh, generally, you're, you're familiar with the fact that lightning is followed by thunder. So you form an association. That means if you see a bolt of lightning, you expect to hear thunder. On the other hand, if you hear thunder but haven't seen the lightning, you're fairly convinced that perhaps behind you, perhaps somewhere that you couldn't look or when you weren't see, watching, lightning struck someplace. You form this association, you're coming up with inferences. And you even came up with you know, the more advanced experiments like pa Pavlo's experiment where, you know, famous experiment with the dog. Now, all of this is fine and the theory of associations perhaps actually still holds water. There's some degree of uh, cognition that's based on association, but then 
it still doesn't answer the basic question. Where exactly are these associations stored and how are they stored? And for that, people initially had all kinds of crazy, almost foolish ideas, like they're stored in the heart, they're stored in the kidney. It took a few, you know, a, a few centuries, a few millennia for people to realize they're actually stored in the brain. And by the mid 1800s, people even knew what the brain was like that it's a mass of interconnected neurons. It has uh, many neurons, billions of them. Well, they didn't know the actual number in the 1800s. And that each of these neurons connects out to many other neurons. Each, each neuron is connected to by many neurons. And so somewhere in this mass of connections, these associations and the general process of cognition is stored. The first person to actually hypothesize how this might be stored was Alex Bain. He was a philosopher, mathematician, logician, linguist, a professor, and he came up with a model for, uh, for uh, how the brain functions way back in 1873. He said the information is stored in the connections. And he even came up with a computational model for it that we will find very familiar. So, he had, he said that the neurons are connected in groups and they excite and stimulate each other, but specifically the manner in which these neurons are connected completely determine what they do. He even came up with these models, models of this kind, where he showed that different combinations of inputs can produce different combinations of outputs. So here, for example, if A and B fire, X fires, if A and C fire, then Z fires, but if B and C fire, Y fires. So the same network will produce different output patterns based on the input pattern. Now this seems very obvious to us, but then back in the 1800s, this was considered kind of outlandish. He also came up with these other models where just changing on the level of excitation, you could get different, uh, or different uh, uh, output behaviors. So here, for example, if the input is weak, only Y will fire. But if it's strong, both X and Y will fire, as you can see. So uh, these are all, this is an interesting computational model. And here's the interesting fact that the very first model for artificial neural networks was proposed in 1873. It's more than 140 years old. And Bain even came up with a mechanism for how these things learn. He said when two impressions concur, or, cl or closely succeed one another, the nerve currents find some bridges or place of continuity according to the abundance of nerve matter available for the transition. So he was basically predicting Hebbian learning. And Hebbian learning is very close to what something that we still learn. So back in 1873, not only were these models proposed, a learning algorithm was also proposed. But then, of course, the problem with smart people is that they're never sure of themselves. I mean, this is one of the hallmarks of being smart. And as Bertrand Russell says, the fundamental cause of the trouble is that in the modern world, the stupid are cocksure, while the intelligence are full of doubt. And Bain was one of those guys who was full of doubt. So he postulated that there must be one million neurons in five billion connections uh, to obtain 200,000 concepts, percepts. And by 1883, he was concerned that, you know, uh, when you begin thinking of learning in the world, there are so many partially formed associations that maybe your skull is too small to be holding a sufficient number of neurons and connections to actually store and process all of this information. And by 1903, he just gave up. He said, oh, I was wrong. Forgive me. And uh, then died. But then, of course, <laughs> today we know that the brain has 80 billion neurons over a trillion connections. There's more than enough capacity in your head to store all of this and more. And so connectionism, the idea that the information lies in the connection lives on. The human brain is a connectionist machine proposed by Bain in 1873 and in fact by a guy called David Ferrier in uh, uh, 1876. The idea here is that neurons connect to other neurons. And the processing capacity of the brain is a function of these connections. So, connect, so when we speak of modern day neural networks, these are connectionist machines which emulate this connectionist model for the brain. What is a connectionist machine? 
something like this. It is a pro network of processing elements where all the elements are connected to one another and all world knowledge is stored in the connections between the elements. Now, this is of, of course fundamentally different from the kind of computers you are familiar with. Uh, you all obviously remember what the structure of modern day computers is. At least those of you who are electrical engineers would recall this. Modern day computers are von Neumann machines. What you, they use what is called the Harvard architecture. So, you have a processing unit and then you have a separate memory which can hold both the programs and the data. And this is why you can use your standard PDA or your, or your, or your computer or your PC and the same machine can perform different tasks because you just change the program or change the data and the same machine can be made to perform different tasks. Whereas in a connectionist machine, the machine itself is the program because the program is in the connections. That means that if you want to change the program, you have to change the machine. And in fact, what we do these days is that we don't actually build these connectionist machines. We emulate them using a von Neumann machine. So, uh, this is the basic difference between the connectionist architecture and your standard von Neumann architectures. So, a recap for what we have seen so far. Neural network based AI has taken over most AI tasks and these networks originally began as computational models of the brain or more generally as models of cognition. The earliest model was of cognition was associationism, but the more recent model is connectionist where we say that neurons connect to neurons and the workings of the brain are encoded in these connections. And current neural network models are connectionist machines. Now, everywhere during this talk, I will have these recap slides at various points. Uh, so, feel free to ask me questions in the mess, you know, interrupt me, stop me. If you don't, I'll just keep continuing like a, you know, like, a, like, like a railway train. So, and that will definitely put you to sleep. It will sometimes put me to sleep. So, uh, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions, particularly at these slides because this is where I begin switching topics. Questions? No? Okay. So, what is a connectionist machine? It is a network of processing elements where we say that all world knowledge is stored in the connections between the elements. So, connectionist units, machines are networks of units. But what are these units? Now, one thing that people might not be familiar with that was that although we are familiar with the connectionist machines of today, multi-layer perceptrons and such like, which actually began to be developed in the 18, 1960s, the earliest connectionist architecture that we would be familiar with was actually proposed by Alan Turing back in the 1940s. So, Turing basically invented everything, but uh, we, won't go, we won't go there. Coming back to our point, uh, connectionist machines are networks of units. So, we need a model for the unit. What is this unit? And again, going back to the fact that we are trying to emulate the human brain, you want these units to look somewhat like the human brain. So, here are the basic units in the brain itself. These are your standard neurons. The neuron has a central head called the soma. It has a bunch of connections called dendrites through which other neurons talk to it. Now, an interesting thing is that these dendrites are where most neurons talk to, uh, most, uh, most other connections to other neurons are made from, but other neurons sometimes also connect to these other regions. They can basically connect anywhere. But for the purpose of this talk, you know, dendrites are the uh, points from which other neurons connect to this neuron and send signals to the neuron. If the total incoming signal exceeds some threshold, this neuron sends a little electric impulse, it, it fires. And that firing goes down this long line called the axon to other neurons out here. These connect to other neurons. This axon is actually is protected by this little sheet of fat, sheet of fat <laughs> called the myelin sheath which are produced by glial cells. And uh, an interesting uh, fact is that the more fat you have in your head, the smarter you are. So, you know, being a fat head is actually a compliment. It turns out the difference between Einstein's brain and your regular brain is not in the number of neurons he had, 
but it turns out he had a lot more fat in his head than, than, than normal people do. This is true. So uh, anyway, getting back to it, getting back to our story. So this is the kind of unit that we actually want to model. And back in 1930, a couple of guys got together, McLeod and Pitts, and came up with the first computational model. Uh, so uh, McLeod was a professor in the University of Chicago at this time. And Walter Pitts was a homeless guy who left his home at the age of 15, never went back and wandered around the University of Chicago looking for things to do. He exchanged mail with, uh, with uh, Bertrand Russell and so on, worked with mathematicians, and one day he ended up at, uh, uh, at Mekelow's door. And so for those of you who don't know, this is Professor Mekelow, and this is the homeless guy, Pitts, who came to his home. So they, and when Pitts came to Mekelow, he was 20 years old, actually less than 20. And they got together to build the first model for the neuron. And you're familiar with the model. It, their first model was not quite this, but here is the computational model. You have many inputs to the neuron. Each of them has a weight. So the neuron itself gets a weighted combination of inputs. And this weighted com combination is compared to a threshold. If the weighted combination exceeds the threshold, the neuron fires. Now, again, this is not exactly McElroy and Pitt's neuron, but it's very similar, similar to it. The paper itself, a mathematical model of, of a neuron, was, uh, was revolutionary back in, the, back in the day. And this defines, introduces the concept of threshold logic. It's full of gobbledygook math that Walter Pitts came up with on his own. And few people have actually been able to decode it, and we don't use it anymore. But it's still a brilliant paper, and Pitts was 20 years old. He was illiterate. He had never even finished high school. Uh, anyway, so their basic model had these two components. They had excitatory synapses, which transmit weighted inputs to the neuron. They, have, they had inhibitory side synapses. Any signal from an inhibitory synapse to the neuron forced the output to zero. So the activi activity of any inhibitory synapse, uh, synapse uh, absolutely prevents excitation of the neuron at that time, regardless of other inputs. So here are, and they showed that this basic unit can, uh, can perform Boolean functions. So here are some of the models they actually had in their paper. In each case, the uh, neuron is, is, uh, re requires an input, two inputs for it to fire. So here is a basic delay. If this neuron fires, this neuron gets two inputs and one instant later, and then it fires. This one is an OR. If either of these neuron fires, this one gets two inputs, and so it fires. This is an AND. Unless both of these neurons fire, this is not going to get two inputs. So this will not fire. So this is only going to fire when both of these inputs, both incoming connections are on. This is one and not two. So if one fires and two is off, then this thing gets two inputs, and so it fires. But if two is on, two is actually a inhibitory the neuron. Two inhibits the output of this neuron, and so this whole thing will not fire. So this is n1 and not n2. So you see how, they are, how you can actually form different kinds of Boolean functions uh, with, these, uh, with, these, uh, uh, with, the, with these units. And Mekela and Pitts were kind of uh, highly optimistic about the nature of their, of their model. They made many claims, including that this could emulate any Turing machine, except, uh, which of course wasn't true. It's, uh, and uh, they also didn't provide a mechanism by which this machine could actually learn. Sure, if you have all of these structures, it can perform magic. But where do those structures come from? How, how, how are these learned? And for that, the first uh, real model was, came almost 19 years later from Donald Hebb in this wonderful paper called, uh, it's, in, it's in a book called Organization of Behavior. And he came up with this basic concept. Hebb was another of those very interesting characters back in the day, and uh, uh, neuroscience was just one of the many things he did. But then he came up with this theory that neurons that fire together, wire together. So what, what was the, 
this is something that this is actually a model that we still use. What exactly does it mean? Here is a simple model of what a neuron, neural connection looks like. This is an axonal connection from neuron X to neuron Y. And any time this neuron fires, the signal comes down here, signal, uh, chemicals are transmitted through this gap, and this guy fires. And what happens is that in, any time this sort of connection actually causes a signal to be transmitted from one neuron to the other, the neuron that's receiving the signal grows a little. And by and by this gap is reduced and the strength of the connection is actually increased. So, so the model that I have had was that if neuron Xi repeatedly triggers neuron Y, then the synaptic knob connecting Xi to Y gets larger, this knob gets larger. And the mathematically, he said that the weight of the connection increases by some eta times xy any time both x and y fire together. So if x fires and at the same time y fires, it doesn't mean that x causes y. If they just fire together, then this thing gets stronger. Now this is obviously not a very good model because as you can see, there's no way for the weights to decrease. So over time, all the weights will keep increasing. This whole thing will saturate and the entire mechanism is going to become uninformative and useless. But this, was act, but this was the very first model proposed for learning. And it's the basis for many learning algorithms that we still have. It took another decade or so for a somewhat better model to be proposed by this guy, Frank Rosenblatt, uh, who was the reason Yale stopped receiving funding to work on AI for over a decade. Uh, so uh, he was a psychologist, psychologist and a logician and he invented the number 42, the solution answer to everything, also known as the perceptron. So uh, this was one of the early perceptrons. You can see it's a fairly complex piece of hardware. And the model that we are familiar with for perceptrons was originally due to Rosenblatt. His, his actual model was fairly complex, but then you sort of, when you whittle it down to its basic structure, this is the structure. You have many inputs. Each input has a, has a weight. So the perceptron itself receives a weighted combination of inputs. If that exceeds a threshold, it fires. So mathematically, this is the structure. If the weighted combination of inputs plus a bias is greater than zero, which is the equivalent of saying if the weighted combination of inputs exceeds a threshold, this neuron fires. Otherwise, it does not. So this is basic threshold logic. It was proposed by uh, Rosenblatt and uh, he, like everybody else in those days, kind of exaggerated its abilities. And everybody, everyone around him also did so. So he was heavily funded by the Navy for his work. And here is, uh, he thought this one little thing, not a network, just this one little thing could solve all of the world's problems. It, it, could, it, was, a universal it was a universal computational machine. And you had crazy articles like these, the embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Uh, or, you know, Frankenstein monster designed by Navy that thinks, 1958. All of these articles came out in the newspapers in the, late, in the 50s. And of course, anytime you exaggerate the capacity of something of this kind, then there's a, you know, blowback, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, one other thing, Rosen, thing Rosenblatt actually came up with was a way of learning. So he didn't just come up with the models. He came up with a computational mechanism for these things to learn. Uh, a sequence every, in that every, these perceptrons could look at input-output pairs and keep updating themselves using this now familiar perceptron learning rule, where at each, uh, after each input, the, the weights of the connections would be updated according to the difference between what the perceptron actually output and you, what you wanted it to, to, to output in response to the input x. Now this is a very familiar uh, equation for many of us. This is a standard learning algorithm that we use in many, many situations. This was originally due to uh, Frank Rosenblatt and he even proved the convergence. So obviously he had, uh, uh, this, was, this was a significant step ahead. Now one thing he was right about was that these are fantastic Boolean units. So 
uh, perceptrons can form any can perform any Boolean computation. So here the weights of the this, these are all perceptrons with two inputs the weights of the inputs are written on top of the arrows. So this connection has a weight of 1, this one has a weight of 1. The threshold is inside the circle this has a threshold of 2. So if x and y are both 1 the total input coming in is 2 which matches the threshold and this will fire. So this is an AND gate x and y. This one has a threshold of 1. So if either x or y is 1 the incoming the, the incoming uh, signal is 1 which matches the threshold so this will fire. The only time it will not fire is if both x and y are 0. So this is an OR gate. Here if x fires then what comes in as minus 1 which is below the threshold so this will not fire. But if x is 0 the total signal coming in is 0 which matches the threshold so this will fire. So this is a NOT gate. So you can see that this basic perceptron could perform all kinds of Boolean computations. Unfortunately 1968 Minsky and Papert they did not even bother to write a paper about it. It was just a chapter in a book uh, where they said blah this thing cannot perform an XOR and they were right. And uh, until then of course the Navy had been funding Yale to laugh for large sums of money and then they discovered that you know it was all fake and then after that Yale was blacklisted for 10 years. They never got money. But then what Minsky and Papert also showed that although a single unit could not perform an XOR. If you network them then they can do all kinds of crazy things. So if, if you took, took a unit now consider the brain. The brain is not just a single neuron. The brain has a large connection is a connection of billions of neurons right. Same thing over here. So if you took these units took a large number of them and connected them to one another then they could perform other interesting computations like the XOR. So here is a network of three neurons. This first layer this guy computes x or y this this perceptron with incoming weights of minus 1 computes not x or not y. This is an AND. So if both of these fire then this guy fires. So this whole structure computes x x or y. So this is an XOR. Now so you are able to perform an XOR using perceptrons so long as you connect multiple of these. These units in the middle their outputs are never seen. You only see the, the only output that you actually see is this guy. So these are hidden units, they are hidden layers, they form a hidden layer. They are hidden because their actual outputs are not directly relevant. What you are really interested, what you observe is this output. But this but the network of perceptrons with a hidden layer can perform an XOR. But once you realize that you can connect these things to perform an XOR, you realize that you can connect these things to perform more complicated Boolean operations like this one. So here is a crazy MLP which computes this rather crazy formula of these Boolean inputs. A multilayer perceptron can compose arbitrarily complicated Boolean functions. And we'll talk more about this in the next part. So the story so far, neural networks began as computational models of the brain. They are connectionist machines. And uh, they basically comprise networks of neural units. The McElloan Pitts model used the neurons as Boolean threshold units which model the brain as performing pro propositional logic. They didn't have a learning rule. Hebb's learning rule was that neurons that fire together wire together. It's unstable. The Rosenblatt's perceptron, which is which is the basic unit that we use these days, uh, was a variant of the McElloan Pitts neuron with a provably convergent learning rule. But individual perceptrons are limited in their capacity. Multilayer perceptrons, however, can model arbitrarily complex Boolean functions. Questions? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> Doesn't matter, you're loud enough. Go ahead. Okay, I'm loud enough. Uh -huh. 
the, so the, the threshold itself is a parameter of the unit. So the basic unit structure is the same. The weights and the threshold are parameters. You change them to get different Boolean functions. Right? So, anything else? Right. Let me continue. So, but then we talked about Boolean functions, right? The brain does not operate on Boolean inputs, it actually operates on real valued inputs and we are always making non-Boolean inferences and predictions. So how does this apply to our uh, computational model? Let us go back and look at the perceptron with real inputs. So you have a collection of inputs, you are looking at weighted combinations of these inputs and if the weighted combination exceeds the threshold T, the neuron fires. Now in our world these are real valued, the weights also are real valued. So the, per the perceptron fires if the weighted combination, the real value which is the weighted combination of these inputs exceeds the threshold. So in some settings instead of having a threshold you can actually have a sigmoid. This is what you are familiar with if you are working with neural networks and in this case you can think of the output as having a probability of firing. This is something that I will get back to much later maybe after the break, well definitely after the break but this, is our, but this is a concept that I just want to introduce right now but for now let us go back with assuming this simple model that this perceptron is going to fire if the weighted combination of inputs exceeds a threshold. What function, what does that function actually look like? So here is the perceptron again, the output is 1 if the weighted combination of inputs exceeds the threshold, it is 0 otherwise. The actual point at which the output switches from going being 0 to being 1 is when this weighted combination exactly equals this threshold. That is the equation of a hyperplane. So if I have for example two dimensional inputs, then this is going to be the weighted combination of both inputs being equal to a threshold. This of course is the equation for a line and what this this equation means is that whenever the input lies on one side of the line, the output is 0. When it is on the other side of the line, the output is 1. More generally when it is on one side of a hyperplane, it is going to be 0. On the other side of the hyperplane, it is going to be 1. So if I plotted this in three dimensions, this is what it would look like. Here is the line. On this side, the output is 0. On this side, the output is 1. So the perceptron actually models this little step function. But once you have this, you can do very interesting things. So first, I can compose Boolean gates. If my line looks like this, in, in my examples I had very specific weights and thresholds. Are those magic values? No, it turns out that I can draw any line. If, if, I, if my inputs are Boolean, then the inputs are going to be either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 or 1, 0. Any line that separates this space in this manner is going to produce a 1 over here and a 0 over here, any combination of weights and thresholds. And so this is going to be an, what gate is this? This is an OR gate. Same thing, if I move the line out here, this is going to produce a 1 for this and 0 out here. This is an AND gate. If I move it like so, it is reflecting the input. This becomes a NOT gate. So I can compose all kinds of Boolean functions and it, you also see why you cannot compose an XOR. An XOR is going to have a 1 for these guys and 0 on both sides. So you need a step function. Whereas a perceptron does not compute a step function. I mean, you, you, you do not get a square, uh, a function that looks like a square. As perceptron is a simple step, an XOR would need something that goes up and goes back down. That a perceptron cannot compute. Anyway, going back to our point that our perceptron is basically separating the space into a region where the output is 1 and another region where the output is 0, we can now begin composing more complex uh, decision boundaries. So for example, let us say I want a little function which produces a 1 inside this pentagon and 0 outside. How would I do it? Very simple. I am going to have one perceptron. Well, this upper region is yellow and the lower region is white. Somehow the color is not showing. Can you see a yellow over here? No, so it's, well, the upper region is yellow, that's a 1, the lower region is 0, right, that's, that's a white. So I can have one perceptron capturing this line. I can have another perceptron, actually there's a faint yellow, I can see it anyway, which is a 1 out here and a 0 out here. 
I can have a third one which produces a 1 out here and a 0 out here. A fourth one which produces a 1 here and a 0 here. A fifth one which produces a 1 over here and a 0 here. And then I can add one more perceptron which is just ands all, the, all of them. Which means all five of them must have an output of 1 for the fifth perceptron to fire and voila. I actually have a little circuit which produces a 1 if the input lies within the pentagon and 0 outside. And the moment I do this, I can make it even more complex. So for example, if I want a decision boundary which looks like this, where the output is a 1 if it's either inside one of these pentagons and 0 outside, then here's how I do it. I have one portion of the circuit which produces the first pentagon, the second portion which produces the second pentagon, I or the two, which is also a perceptron as we know, and now I have this interesting decision boundary, right? And then I can make my decision boundaries even more interesting. So I can have something completely undefined like this one, or something that looks like a human being, or something that looks like a horse. And how would we do it? We can just decompose these structures into little pentagons, have little uh, MLPs for each pentagon, and then, I mean, uh, polygons, uh, have a little MLP for each polygon and or the lot. We will get back to this. And when I want even more complex decision boundaries, so when I'm performing a task of classification, for instance, if I'm trying to classify inputs, pixels, as a digit, then I'm really looking at a 784 dimensional input space. And some region of the space contains all the values, all the pixel arrangements that represent the digit 2. And so what I'm really looking, trying to do is to compose an MLP that explicitly captures this region of the space. And we know exactly how to do this. So in other words, uh, a multilayer perceptron can capture any arbitrary decision boundary. So MLPs are, com are connectionist computation models. They can model Boolean functions. Individual perceptrons can act as Boolean gates. And networks of perceptrons can be arbitrarily complex Boolean functions. They are, in fact, Boolean machines. What do I mean by this? They represent Boolean functions over linear boundaries, which means they can model arbitrary decision boundaries. And these can be used to classify data. But then, what does it really model? Is there a semantic interpretation to this, uh, to this whole thing. So let's go back and look at the weights. Look at the perceptron itself. Here is the perceptron. It has, a weight, it has some real input. It has some real weights. So when I, this weighted sum of these two can be thought of as an inner product of this input vector and the weights vector. And if this inner product exceeds a threshold, the perceptron fires. If it doesn't exceed a threshold, the perceptron does not fire. But what exactly does this, what does this uh, signify? Now here, here's a somewhat outrageous statement. If I limit the size of the, the, of the input, then it turns out that almost all vectors, in high, di in high dimensions, almost all vectors are exactly the same length. So why would that be? As you increase the dimensionality of, of, of the space, the volume, the proportion of the volume of a sphere that lies close to the skin keeps increasing. For an infinite dimensional sphere, the entire volume lies on the skin. So which means that in high dimensional spaces, pretty much any random vector that you can choose is going to lie very close to the surface of the sphere, which means they're all the same length. And so when I'm comparing the inner product, that's uh, fact number one. Fact number two, the inner product between two vectors is simply a function of the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So when I say, is the inner product greater than a threshold, I'm really asking the question, is cos theta greater than some value? In other words, I'm asking if the angle between the two vectors is less than some value. So in other words, the perceptron is going to fire if the input is close enough in angle to the weights vector. The weights vector specifies the kind of inputs that the perceptron really likes. And so a perceptron is simply a correlation filter. If the correlation between the weight pattern and the inputs exceeds a threshold, it's going to fire, otherwise not. So here, for example, 
if the perceptron is working on this grid as an input and if the blacks represent the ones and the whites represent the zeros and this is the uh, pattern of the weights then if an input has this structure the correlation between the two is low it will not fire whereas the, if the input has this structure if I accept a correlation of 0.82 the correlation is high enough the perceptron is going to fire. So the perceptron is a correlation filter and now when you think of what happens when you perform a full classification task. So let us say our task is to look at these LED patterns and decide if the, if, if the pattern on it is a digit or not. Then you would expect that the first layer perceptrons are going to be feature detectors, they are correlation filters, they are feature detectors, but specifically the kind of features they are going to detect are going to be relevant to the task being performed. So here for example, you would expect them to see, detect patterns like these because digits are formed of patterns like these. In fact, you may also have others which look for other kinds of patterns that will not be seen in a digit, right? The kinds of patterns that are not interesting are those that will both be seen in a digit and other, other things that are not digits. So you expect the first layer of perceptrons to detect if certain patterns have occurred in the input. The rest of the network is a Boolean function of these over these feature detectors. If these features occur in certain combinations, it represents the occurrence of a digit, otherwise the di a digit has not occurred. And you can also sort of uh, extend this logic to additional layers. Any, any case, the key point here is that it is important for the first layer of this network to capture relevant patterns. And you can even extrapolate this intuition to say that you would expect the higher level neurons to compose more complex patterns from the input. So here for example, it would not be irrational to assume that the second level of neurons individually identify the various digits 0 through 9 and the final neuron is going to fire if at least one of these guys is fired. This would be a digits, digits uh, detector. So continuing our lesson, perceptrons are correlation filters and MLPs are Boolean formulae over patterns detected by perceptrons. Higher level perceptrons may also be viewed as feature detectors. And as an extra in classification, the network will fire if the combination of detected basic features matches an acceptable pattern for a desired class of signal. For example, appropriate combinations of noses, eyes, eyebrows, cheek and chin might detect a face. So you would expect the low level feature detectors to capture patterns like these. And continuing on, we have looked at perceptrons or multilayer perceptrons as classification engines or Boolean functions, but then they can also perform regression. To see how, consider a function of a single input. So this Think of a multilayer perceptron that takes a scalar input and, is pr and produces a scalar output. Let's start with a basic unit of this kind. This has just, just got only two perceptrons. The first one has a threshold T1, the second has a threshold T2. So the first perceptron will fire if the input exceeds T1. The second one will fire if the input exceeds T2. If both of these perceptrons fire, these weights are 1 and minus 1, so they will cancel out. In other words, the output is going to be 1 when this guy fires and this one does not. So as x goes from minus, minus infinity to plus infinity, this little structure is going to fire when the input exceeds T1. It's going to stay high till the input gets to T2 and when the input exceeds T2, it's going to go back to 0. So this little construction simply constructs a little square wave between, uh, square between T1 and T2. But once I know how to do this, I can build more complex functions. So I can build this crazy function of a scalar input by taking many pairs and each pair is going to operate on a small range of inputs. I can scale that output by the corresponding height and then I can approximate this entire function as a series of, little, of these little uh, pulses. So an MLP with many units can model an arbitrary function over an input to arbitrary precision. Now this is obviously an approximation, but I can make the approximation less and less imprecise. 
by making these little pulses narrower and narrower and uh, get arbitrary precision. So this actually generalizes to functions of any number of inputs, which we will see in the next part of the lecture. So the story so far, MLPs are classification engines. They can identify classes in the data. Individual perceptrons are feature detectors. The network fires if the combination of the detected basic features matches an acceptable pattern for the desired class of signal, but they can also model continuous valued functions. So I'll stop here. Any questions? I'm going to skip to part two. Back there. Can you just speak on the So I had this question when I was looking at the slide of the octagon, uh, the classification of the octagon as well as two different shapes together, or the regression one, suggests that uh, uh, how well the uh, perceptron learns depends on the number of uh, hidden layers uh, as well as the hidden units. For, for instance, in this case, we want five units and then to have two shapes, you would need two layers. So these are sort of the hyperparameters which are deciding how well the parameter uh, this does. So my question is, um, all of it boils down to identifying these two. And then also, uh, if we look at the regression example, if you get this perfectly, then it is m more or less overfitting the model. So h how does this go? So you're, I'm only speaking of part one. I was just telling you what a neural, neural network really is. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of skipping ahead to part two and part three of my lecture, right? Uh, uh, but yes. Uh, all of these are issues and we'll get to it very shortly. The key point of the fir first, uh, what I've covered so far, is to tell you what is an MLP. MLPs is, uh, are, are connectionist computational models. They can be, they, they can model pretty much any Boolean function. They can model pretty much any classification boundary and they can model pretty much any regression to arbitrary precision. So these are that's all we, are say, we have said so far. Okay. Now the details of how they will model it, what are the limitations, I'll get to in the second, second lecture. Uh, the one thing I am not talking about today is how exactly to determine what the optimal structure of these things is. Now that's an enti uh, entirely different kind, you know, that would have to be an extension of, uh, of, of my lecture today. But it turns out it's a very interesting topic where you have this uh, uh, kind of difficult uh, you know, intersection of what is optimal and what we can learn, which leads to all kinds of blind alleys. And maybe if you have any, you know, if you have time offline, sure. I could uh, discuss this. Thank you. But anything else? Yeah. Well, a threshold is a nonlinearity. Right? Yeah. All right. So let me get to the next part. And I may not actually get through this entire part. I will stop in half an hour. What can a network represent? So here's a recap. What we've seen so far. The perceptron is a threshold unit. It fires if the weighted sum of the inputs and the bias is positive. So if the weighted sum of the inputs minus t is positive. I can say z is this weighted combination. If that's greater than 0, this is going to fire. Otherwise, it doesn't. So I can think of this as the entire structure as two parts. First, something that computes the z. The second, that applies this threshold function to the z. And the kind of net new perceptrons that we are familiar with typically don't have a threshold function over here. They have a soft sigmoid, uh, in which case the output is going to look like a sigmoid. It's a squashing function instead of a threshold. Uh, the uh, uh, sigmoid is what we call an activation. So the term activation in general ref ref refers to the function that acts on the weighted combination of inputs and the threshold. And there are various kinds of activations that we have encountered uh, in our, when we uh, 
when we work with neural networks like the sigmoid, the tan age, the soft plus, the rectifier. For now, I'm going to continue assuming that we are using threshold activations because as it turns out, threshold activations are really nice. This business of switching between 0 and 1 provides you great intuition into how these things actually work. But then there is a distinction between a threshold and the soft activations and I'll get to towards the last part of this particular part of the lecture, which might be after the break. So the recap, the multilayer perceptron is a network of perceptrons generally layered. And when we speak of multilayered perceptrons, these days we are always speaking of deep neural networks. We have a notion of depth. So what do we mean? What? Yeah. By a deep network. For a moment my audio went off. So it turns out there is a very clear notion of depth. It's a deep is not an abstract term. Deep is a well defined term. Anytime you have a directed graph, a directed acyclic graph, then the then the depth is the length of the longest path from a source node to a sink node. So here, for example, I have a graph with three nodes. There's one path from the source to the sink, which is just length one, but there's a second one, which is length two. So this, the depth of this network is two. Here is a graph with four nodes. This is a source, this is a sink, there is a path which is length just one. There's also a path which is length two, and then there's a path which is length three. Three is the longest one, so this is a graph with depth three. So there's a very clear technical definition of deep. And when we are speaking of layered structures, these are the kinds of structures which structures which, have, which we are familiar with. We might have additional skips, it does not really matter. But then here, the depth of the structure over here as you can see is 1, 2, 3. So when I say I have a deep graph or a deep network, the assumption is that the depth is greater than 2, meaning it is not just one hop, but there are at least two hops to get to the output. So that is the technical definition of a deep network. Now, the MLPs that we have looked at have either real or Boolean stimuli. The outputs are either real or Boolean values. You can also have multiple outputs for a single input. But then this of course is a deep network because it has depth 1, 2, 3, 4. What can networks of this kind actually compute? What kind of input output relationships can it model? We have already seen this to some extent in the first part. MLPs can compose Boolean functions of any kind. In other words, they are universal Boolean functions. They can also compose real valued functions. So they are universal real valued functions of some kind. But are they really universal? What, what are the limitations of a network of this kind? How well, let us consider Boolean functions for a start. How well do MLPs model Boolean functions? So I must warn you over here, I am making a few assumptions about the network in, the, in this part of the lecture. And I am not going to reveal the assumptions till I get to the end of the lecture. So if you feel bamboozled at the end of the lecture, do not blame me, I have warned you. Right? Uh, the, uh, let us go back and look at what we have uh, already looked at. The perceptron can model any simple Boolean gate. We have already seen this. But then a perceptron is not just a simple Boolean gate. A perceptron is a very unique kind of unit. It can perform a majority operation, meaning a single perceptron can perform operations like are the total number of inputs that, that is the total number of inputs that takes the value 1 at least k. It can compute an at least operation which a simple Boolean gate cannot. So as a result of being also being a majority, uh, the ability to compute a majority for function, it can compute functions like these. It can be a universal AND gate. So it can say that this neuron will only fire if x1 through xl are all 1 and xl plus 1 through xl, xn are all minus 1. So you can just see how this works. For everything that you want to be 1, you are going to use a weight of 1. For everything that you want to be 0, sorry, dot minus 1, you are going to use a weight of minus 1. And this threshold is simply going to be the number of 1s. So anytime one of these guys becomes non-zero, then the sum is going to become less than L 
and this will not fire. So this is a universal AND gate where you can, you can specify the exact pattern that you must see for this, for this perceptron to fire. Uh, you, it's also a universal OR gate where you can say that if you see any portion of this pattern, I want to fire. So I can say that this one will, must fire if any of these guys is 1 or any of these guys is 0. So here again, the ones that you want to be 1 are all 1, the ones that you want to be 0 are all minus 1. The only thing that changed is the threshold. And so you can see what these are. You know, in one case, you can specify the exact pattern. And if it see, unless it sees the complete pattern, it's not going to fire. In the other case, you can specify a pattern and say if it sees any small portion of this pattern, it must fire. And you can also do these things. If, you know, you only fire the total number of uh, uh, total uh, number of these units, or the total number of these units that is zero is at least k. So you can even you can even specify what fraction of the pattern must be seen for the for the neuron to fire. So if I have an n bit n input pattern, and I, I can specify the pattern over those n bit inputs, and I want to say I can say I want at least 40% of this pattern to be seen for this perceptron to fire. So it's a very powerful unit as you can see, although it's a very simple, looks like a very simple Boolean structure. And regardless of something, this is what fooled uh, Frank, Frank Rosenblatt, that you can build these really complicated structures. I want to see this entire, uh, uh, entire pattern or I want to see 40% of this pattern or 20% of these pattern before I fire. That's amazing if you think about it. We don't actually stop to think about how these things work. And it's amazing enough to have fooled a really smart guy for very many years. But then it can't do an XOR. And for an XOR, we need a multilayer perceptron with a hidden layer. Now, once we impose the hidden layer, we realize we've already seen that you can compose any odd Boolean function anything at all. So MLPs are universal Boolean functions. They can model any Boolean function that you want. You can just build an MLP for the, for the Boolean function of your choice. But then in this little structure, my MLP has many layers. It has one, two, two hidden layers. Uh, or I could have other structures with more hidden layers than two. So although it's a universal Boolean function, how many layers does my MLP need to have for it to be a universal Boolean function? It turns out you can do this with just one, just one hidden layer. How is that? A Boolean function is just a truth table. We all know this. So I can specify a Boolean function in this manner. These are all the x1 through x5 are the inputs. Y is the output. This, uh, for some combinations of inputs, you want the output to be 1. For other combinations, you want the output to be 0. So I can reduce my truth table and only specify the particular combinations for which the output is 1 or 0 for that matter. Right? So this truth table actually has many more lines. There are 32 rows, but I don't have to specify the remaining rows because the output is all 0. Now this, this is a function. This is the Boolean function. This function takes the value 1 if x1 is 0, x2 is 0, x3 is 1, x4 is 1, and x5 is 0. Or if x1 is 0, x2 is 1, x3 is 0, x4 is 1, and x5 is 1. Or x1 is 0, x2 is 1, x3 is 1, x4 is 0, and x5 is 0, and so on. There are six such conditions under which this Boolean function takes the value 1. So I can represent this entire function using a disjunctive normal form. The disjunctive normal form is going to have six clauses, one per row. Each clause is going to represent one combination of inputs. So this is zeros become noughts, ones remain as it is, as is. So this is not x1 and not x2, and x3 and x4 and not x5. If this pattern happens, I want the output to be 1. The plus is an or, or not x1 and x2 and not x3 and x4 and x5. If this pattern happens, I want the output to be 1. So I have six rows. My DNF formula is going to have six clauses. And so I can have one perceptron for the first clause, one for the second, one for the third, one for the fourth, one for the fifth, one for the sixth. Put a perceptron which R's the lot, voila. I have an MLP 
which captures this Boolean function. I can do this with any truth table at all. So this means that a one hidden layer MLP is a universal Boolean function. That's pretty amazing. I just need a multi-layer perceptron with just one hidden layer and this can model pretty much any Boolean function. But then what is the largest number of perceptrons required in this one hidden layer? Again, we're going to address this issue of depth. And so for that, if one layer can do it, how many neurons do I need in that one hidden layer for it to model any Boolean function at all? To answer this question, let's look at how small we can make the DNF formula for a Boolean function. Now, how many of you are familiar with Carnot maps? Anyone? A small number, okay. Uh, and so a Carnot map is basically a topological map to represent binary patterns. And if you're, if you're an electrical engineer, you know all about Carnot maps. If you're a computer scientist and you don't know about Carnot maps, shame on you, right? Uh, no, you should. Uh, so this is, this is a Carnot map for, for four bits. Here, I this, this, the rows, the columns represent pair, two variables. The rows represent two variables. So this is YZ. This column represents the combination 00s, 0, 0, 0, 01, 1, 1, and 10. 1, These are patterns of WX, 0, 0, 0, 01, 1, 1, 1, 0. Because I have four inputs, there are 16 possible combinations. So this box has 16 values uh, and uh, 16 squares. And what is magic is that if you look at any two adjacent rows, only one bit changes. And the whole thing is actually a toroid. So this connects to this, this connects to this. So this guy is adjacent to this one, this guy is adjacent to this one. Now this is a truth table. And in this truth table, the highlighted boxes are all the values for which the output is one, all the combinations for which this output is one. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven combinations of inputs for which this output is one. So if I just used a simple DNF formula for this guy, the DNF formula is going to have seven clauses. But then Here's something I can do. I can group these clauses. These four are adjacent to one another. This is the magic of the Cardinal map. So if I group these guys, it basically tells me that all of these four are one, which means that the value of W and X do not matter. So these four together can be grouped into a single clause, not Y, not Z. Similarly, I can group these two guys together. If I group these two guys together, it means that the value of z doesn't matter. So now this becomes a class not w, x, not y. Similarly, these two can be grouped together. In fact, I can group these four together. And th if I group these two together, it becomes not x, y, not z. And so now I have three groups, which means that the DNF formula for this truth table only has three clauses. clauses. And the MLP that I built for this guy actually only has three units in the hidden layer. But now, the question I'm trying to answer is, how large must the hidden layer be? The alternative way to answer the question for this is this, what is the pattern I will require on this Carnot map that can simply not be grouped into a smaller, what is the largest pattern that can simply not be grouped into a smaller set of groups? Anyone? A chess, right? This is the largest pattern that can simply not be grouped. And now if I want to compose a one layer MLP for this pattern, how many neurons will I require in the hidden layer? As many as the number of red boxes. That's going to be eight. So for this Boolean function, I will need nine perceptrons, eight of these in the hidden layer, and the final order. Now I can extend this to three dimensions. This is a three-dimensional Carnot map. I mean, this, I just made this up, but uh, there are three variables over here. This, this represents all uh, YZ patterns. These are all WX patterns. Wait, no, these are all YZ patterns. These are all WX patterns. These are all UV patterns. And over here, this obviously has 64. This is actually a four-dimensional toroid. This has 64 squares. And if I make every alternate, highlight every alternate square, this is a truth table with 32 rows which cannot be grouped, which means that if I want to build a DNF formula for this one, that DNF formula is going to need 32 clauses. 
So if I want to build an MLP that represents this function using just one hidden layer, then it's going to need 32 neurons in the hidden layer. Generalizing, if I have n inputs, I'm going to require in the worst case 2 raised to n minus 1 perceptrons in the hidden layer if I want to build this entire function using an MLP with just one hidden layer. It's exponential in the number of inputs. But then, if I'm willing to use additional layers, how many layers will I require? require? And to answer this question, here is a key observation. These are the two functions. This is, these, this is just a complex XOR. W XOR X, XOR Y, XOR Z. This is an XOR. U XOR V, XOR W XOR X, XOR Y, XOR Z. And we know that an XOR can be built using just three perceptrons. As a matter of fact, if I allow the first unit to be skipped, I can build an, an XOR using just two perceptrons. But for now, we're going to assume that three is sufficient. So if I can build an XOR with three perceptrons, then this function can be built like so. I need three perceptrons for every single XOR. So this is W XOR X, XOR Y, this is XOR Y, XOR Z. So there are three XORs. Each XOR needs three perceptrons. I can build this thing with nine perceptrons. I do not, which didn't really help me for this four, two, you know, this uh, 16 box uh, uh, truth table. But if I go up to this one, for each pair, I just, I, I just need three perceptrons. Now, instead of requiring 33 perceptrons, I can get away with 15. But two, four, and six inputs really don't tell the story. Here is where it, the, the, here, here is the real magic. For the XOR of n variables, I can work with just three times n minus one perceptrons, actually two times n minus one perceptrons. So in other words, the comparing the two, if I want a single hidden layer, I'm going to require two raised to n minus one plus one perceptrons in all, including two raised to n minus one perceptrons in the hidden layer. So this is going to be exponential in the size of the input. On the other hand, if I'm willing to have depth, then I can get away with just three times n. It's linear in the size of the input. So, uh, so this is what depth gives us. Something that was exponentially sized shrank into being linearly sized. And now, what are the limitations on these? Here, I can point out that this structure that I had over here didn't have to be structured in this manner. I can actually arrange it much more compactly. For n inputs, I can arrange it in order log 2n layers. And for this, the fact, we use the fact that the XOR is an associative function, which means that if I have x1, xor, x2, x2, xor, x3, and so on, I can group these units in any odd way. For example, I can perform the xor of x1 and x2. I can, so this should have been, sorry, x3. I can then perform the xor of x3 and x4, xor the two, and just perform the xor in pairs. So if I do that, I can reorder my structure like this. First, I do the xor of the first two units, that's this guy. Then I do, that, do an XOR of the next two inputs, that's this one here. The XOR of the next two inputs, and that's this one here. So I can pair all of these guys up. I get a bunch of outputs. These are all XORs of pairs. Now again, on these, I have additional XORs. So I can XOR pairs of these, and I get these outputs. Then again, I can XOR pairs of these. I can get, I get these outputs, and then I can XOR those two. So once I begin doing it in pairs, then the actual depth of the network is going to be only log log of n, order log of n, right? And now suppose I decide that I want fewer than order log of n pairs, uh, layers. What happens? If I decide that I'm going to terminate after just five layers, that means that the key point here is that if I stop at any point, the rest of the function is still a complex XOR. And we know that if you want to use an XOR using just one hidden layer, you need an exponential number of units. And so if I decide that I'm going to stop with a shorter, less deep network than what was required for this function, then at some point I have an XOR that's being computed with just one more hidden layer. 
And at that point, I'm going to require an exponential number of inputs from that point on. So reducing the number of layers below the minimum can result in an exponentially sized network to express the function fully. So a network with fewer than the required number of layers can become exponentially large. And if you decide that you're not going to use that large a network, then a network with fewer than the required number of neurons cannot model the function at all. So in fact, the magic with an XOR is that if I take away just one neuron from the basic minimum required to compute the function, this function is going to become perfectly random. I'm going to get 50% error in computing the XOR. All I need to get rid of is one neuron from the basic minimum and the function is screwed. So uh, this gives you an idea of the importance of the size of the network, the trade-off between the depth and the width. So to recap, deep Boolean MLPs that scale linearly with the number of inputs can become exponentially large if recast using only one layer and it gets worse if I have some arbitrary Boolean function which ends up being an XOR after a certain number of layers. From that point on, I'm going to need a minimum number of layers. If I stop short, it's going to become exponential. It can become exponentially large. So now this is a little bit of hand waving. If you want to get formal, this, this XOR is really a parity problem and has been very, very you know, widely studied in the literature. Any Boolean circuit of depth D using just AND, OR, and NOT gates with unbounded fan in must have size 2 raised to n over 2 raised to n raised to 1 over D. That is the actual formula that, uh, uh, that was, I think, due to these guys. Alternately stated, you know or you're familiar with complexity classes, P, N, P, and so on. There are also circuit complexity classes. And so AC0 is the class of circuits of fixed depth. And it turns out parity is not a part of AC0, meaning if you have a circuit, if you decide that my circuit is going to be four layers deep, then the size of the network is going to have to be exponential and the size of the input. Again, the caveat is not all such Boolean circuits. The case of the XOR is kind of very nice. But not all Boolean circuits have such clear depth versus size trade-off. And here, you know, Claude Shannon was uh, basically discovered everything useful that we ever going to need. He already, he has a theorem covering this too. He says that for n greater than 2, there is a Boolean function of n variables that requires at least 2 raised to n over n gates. Or in fact, there's a stronger statement which says that if you take any, if you take the entire set of all possible n input Boolean functions, almost all of them, except for a very, very small and insignificant fraction of n input Boolean functions, the rest of them are going to need an exponential number of gates. So now we are probably not interested in all of these, but with high probability, the class of functions that we are interested in will end up requiring uh, an exponential number of gates, particularly if they are modeled with a finite depth network. So in summary, an MLP is a universal Boolean function, but can represent a given in fu function only if it is sufficiently wide, it's sufficiently deep, and depth can be trade off some for sometimes exponential growth of the width of the network. And the optimal width and depth depend on the number of variables and the complexity of the Boolean function. So the story so far, I'll pause over here, is MLPs are universal Boolean machines. Even a network with a single hidden layer is a universal Boolean machine but a single layer network may require an exponentially large number of perceptrons and deeper networks may require fewer neurons than shallower networks to express the same function. It could be exponentially smaller. Any questions? Yes. So what do you mean by unit that is universal? Then you're going to need only one per one unit. That's it would just no. That's if it's if you have a universal unit, you only need one unit. You won't even need two. So you would have basically solved Frank Rosenblatt's problem. So if you so if you if you have a unit that can express represent the XOR, well, that's actually an interesting question. I think that actually becomes universal. You can represent any function at all. <laughs> 
if it can basically now we are beginning to represent con non convex regions and because it can also do R so it should be able to do the whole thing but and I may but then I may be wrong but I believe that is the case. Okay it is 10 30 are we supposed to be stopping now? Let me just stop after the slide. I have used a simple Boolean circuit analogy for explanation. I have assumed that all of these gates are Boolean. The fact is that the threshold unit is not a Boolean gate. The threshold unit actually computes a majority function and it turns out that a threshold unit could the major if you want to compute a Boolean function majority function using only Boolean gates you are going to need an exponentially exponentially large circuit to compute the majority function. So which means that the threshold unit already compresses an exponentially sized the function into a single unit and that is something I have glossed over simply because it is really hard to explain the everything that I did using threshold units as the basic structure. But then it turns out that a depth to threshold uh, a gate parity circuit can be com composed using order n squared weights. But if you make the depth log n it is still going to need only order n weights. But more generally for large n the majority of Boolean functions require an exponential number of threshold units even if you use threshold units. And uh, so uh, formal analyses typically view these as arithmetic circuits circuits which can compute call polynomials over any field and you can show that if you stop short then the whole thing is going to require of the minimum depth then the whole thing is going to require an exponential number of units. Uh, so I have spoken of working over the you know uh, Boolean numbers but then most analyses work over any field. So I am going in the rest of this part of this part of the lecture I will continue but I am going to come I am going to consider functions over the field of reals. We'll take a break for coffee and if you have any questions you can ask me outside. Hello. Oh, it's very loud. Okay. So let me begin. Please sit down. Uh, I have a very long talk ahead. We are going to be. I have only an hour and a half. Okay. Uh, if I finish early, you get an early break. Uh, so the uh, the. Uh, but then, if you are willing to take that, you also have to take the uh, the alternate. That if I don't finish on time you are going to have to wait right. So that is the deal <laughs> all right let me continue. So any questions about anything that we have covered so far? No okay from here on things get a little more complex. So we were looking at uh, the MLP as a function over real valued inputs it is basically a function that finds a complex decision boundary over the space of reals. So for example if you were looking at 784 dimensional inputs then I could decompose this peanut into any odd shape and, uh, and compute my decision boundaries. Now we saw that a perceptron is a simple linear classifier when I am looking at a weighted combination of inputs and comparing it to a threshold then that is uh, that is the kind of function we get in, in, in two dimensions. I have a line on one side the output is going to be a 1 on the other side it is going to be a 0. If I viewed this in 3D the function that I actually have looks like this step right. And we saw how I can use this to compose arbitrary decision boundaries like the pentagon or like this double pentagon where I would have one portion of the network compute the first pentagon another portion compute the second pentagon I can or the two I can get the more crazy double pentagon uh, decision boundary. And now of course I can use that same idea to compose even more crazy decision boundaries like these like this funky figure to the left or this outline of a person or this horse 
And the way I would do it is to decompose the funky figure into many little polygons, have one little subnet for each polygon or the lot, I get the crazy funky function. So, what this means is that we can compose arbitrarily complex decision boundaries for uh, using a multi layer perceptron, it is a universal classifier. But then my claim is that we can approximate arbitrarily complex decision, decision boundaries using only one hidden layer. So, how would we do this? Or to give you a very simple example, how would I compose this decision boundary using an MLP that has only one hidden layer like so? So, maybe I will pause here for a couple of for a few seconds, 10 or 15 seconds and see if anybody wants to take a chance to you know be brave enough to tell me how this can be done. Anyone? So here is the hint, if I am asking you, I expect you not to know the answer. <laughs> Right. Uh, otherwise, I don't have a lecture, right? So let me go back and uh, demystify this just uh, a little sorry. bit. Sorry. Did someone want to take a guess? I heard words. Yes. Maybe we can use uh, every pixel uh, and uh, uh, this like is continuous valued. So if this is continuous valued, there's no notion of a pixel. But you're somewhere uh, on, right? Like a unit for a pixel, no? It's so th that would be true if this were on a, on a on an integer grid. Yes. So this is real value, but you're close, and we'll see why. Okay, you're very close. We are looking at uh, over reals, and over reals there's no notion of a quantized value, right? But then to see this, uh, let me uh, look at. Uh, actually, that's a very close answer, and you'll see why. So, to begin the to begin to explain, let me start off with a very simple boundary. This is the diamond. The diamond has only four sides. Now, remember that when we, if I want to use the same trick that I used here for uh, to compose the diamond, I'm going to have, I'm going to require four neurons, one for each line and each neuron is going to be a one on one side and a zero on the other side, you know, for, for one, there will be one neuron capturing this line which gives me a one above and a zero below, a second one capturing this line giving me a one here and a zero over here, third one captures this line gives me a one over here and a zero over here, the fourth one captures this one gives me a one here and a zero over here. So this is the only region where all four of them are one. So, if I look at the sum of all of their four outputs, that sum is 4 inside this diamond. So, if I use a threshold of 4, I am going to get just the diamond as a decision boundary. But then, let us look at the actual sum before we apply the threshold. What does that sum look like? That sum is 4 over here, but it is 3 in these infinitely long bands. It is 2 in all of these off diagonal regions. So, if I plotted and plotted it in three dimensions, this is what it would look like. So it's going to be four out here. It's going to be three in these bands which go off to infinity, and in these regions, it's going to be two. So this is for a diamond. But now, let me do this for a pentagon. If I try to build a decision boundary that was a pentagon, then I have five units, one for each of the lines. The sum is five inside. It's four in each of these triangular regions. 3 over here in these wide strips and 2 of these corners. And uh, observe now that here when I had 4 sides, the area of the region that had a sum 3 was infinity. Here when I have 5 sides, the area of the region which had the sum 5 minus 1, 4 is now finite. So here is the actual figure. This, uh, the sum is 5 here, 4 in these little, in this little star, then it is going to be 4 in these blue regions and three in these dark blue regions. And you might see what is happening. If I go up to six sides, something interesting here. So this is six, 
the, the, the region over here within this has a sum 6 in within this, uh, this uh, star of David shape the sum is 5 and then it is 4 in these light blue regions which are these guys and then 3 in of the corners. But observe something interesting that the region where the area is 3 where the sum is 3 has a, has a larger area than the region where the sum is 4. When I go down to say a heptagon, so this is going to be the sum is 7, the 6 is in the, the, the sum is 6 in all of these regions, the sum is 7 in the 7 pointed star, no sorry this is so sum is 5 in the 7 pointed star, it is 6 here and 5 here. So if I go up to 16 sides, you see many many stars of different sizes. What you observe is that it is only the regions where when I have n sides, only the regions which have area which have where the sum is close to n over 2 have infinite area. All the rest of them have finite area. So 64 sides, you can see what the shape is happen, turning out to be. And when I go up to 1000 sides, here is the shape. This is the sum is 1000 over here and it falls off and basically becomes 500 pretty much everywhere else. And so in general, increasing the number of sides reduces the area outside this polygon, uh, reduces the area where the sum lies between n over 2 and n outside of the polygon. And as I keep increasing n, the size of this of the of the uh, the size of the of the area where the sum is greater than n over 2 but less than n keeps decreasing. Eventually for n infinity you get a shape such as this it is going to be the sum over here is or n very large tending to infinity the sum here is n and pretty much everywhere else the sum is going to be n over 2. If you want a nice closed, for closed form formula the formulas are n tending to infinity. So if I divide by 1 over n this n would go away but the formula looks something like this. The point is this that as I keep increasing the number of sides to my polygon then the region of the polygon the region of the space where the sum is not equal to n over 2 keeps shrinking and in the limit you are going to get a really really you are going to get a shape of this kind where the sum is exactly n in here and pretty much everywhere else it is going to be n over 2. So the shape you can sort of abstract it into something like this when the number of sides in my polygon becomes very large thus the sum of the outputs of all of these neurons which is the sum that enters this threshold function ends up becoming something like this cylinder. So forget even what is happening with the threshold even without thresholding the sum is going to look something like a cylinder and now if I use a threshold of n the decision boundary is going to be exactly a circle. But now I can do something interesting instead of having n and n over 2 I can just have I can actually cancel the bias out and make it n over 2 and 0 just so that everything gets balanced out by adding a bias term with a weight of minus n over 2. You still have the structure where if I use a threshold of n over 2 on the, on the sum of all of these guys I am going to get a decision boundary which is a near perfect circle. This means I can take two such circuits and connect them up in parallel and when I connect them up in parallel so long as the two circles do not intersect what I will get is this one is going to create a little cylinder which has some n over 2 outside and 0 everywhere else. This one is going to create a second cylinder which has some n over 2 in the center and 0 everywhere else. If I use both of them together I am going to get two cylinders where the sum is n over 2 here or here and pretty much 0 anywhere else. So now if I use a threshold of n over 2 I am going to get a decision disconnected decision boundary of two circles. Now this is pretty amazing in everything that I actually showed you so far it seemed that the decision boundary had to be some somewhat of a connected shape. This is no longer the case <laughs> which means now I can just pile a whole lot of these things on and this is how I would do this with just one hidden layer. I am going to have many 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 subnets each of them composing one little cylinder. I can add all of their outputs and then apply a threshold of k times n over 2 right and I would end up with a figure that begins to approximate the, uh, the, the double pentagon and if I want to make to make the approximation more and more accurate 
I'm going to increase the number of sides okay, in each of my little circles. I can reduce the radius. I can increase the number. And I can make this approximation arbitrarily precise. So what this means is that a multilayer perceptron can capture any classification boundary, but a one layer multilayer perceptron can capture, model any classification boundary. That is, MLPs are universal classifiers, but even a one layer MLP is a universal classifier. Now again, it's a universal approximator. Why is it an approximator? Because this is not, you know, you'd need, an in, you need, you'd need to go to infinite cylinders before the approximation was precise. But you can make, you know, was, in fact, it's never going to be completely accurate, but you can make this as arbitrarily precise. So it's an approximator. But in any case, a one layer MLP is a universal approximator. But then, here's, look, look at this figure. If I wanted to do this with just one hidden layer, I needed infinite neurons. If I was willing to add one more hidden layer, I could get away with just 5, 10, 11, 12, 12 neurons, 30 neurons. So just adding depth can tremendously increase, uh, decrease the number of neurons that your network actually requires to capture a specific decision boundary. Uh, so now, formal analyses typically view these as a category of arithmetic circuits. They speak of computing polynomials over any field. Leslie Valiant has a paper uh, way back in the 80s who shows that a polynomial of degree n requires a network of depth log squared n. So that's how deep the network must be for you to be able to compute the polynomial accurately. And if you have fewer than that many layers, you, you actually cannot compute the polynomial with anything less than an arbitrarily large number of neurons. And take also consider that your typical decision boundary, your kip, kip, the tip, the, if you choose an arbitrary function the, and you want to represent it using a polynomial, the typical function is either a very high order polynomial or exponential, which means that it's an infinite order polynomial, which means that for most decision boundaries, you're going to need very deep networks for them to be uh, modeled with any degree of precision using a finite number of neurons. Uh, Yashua, Benjo et al. actually also have a similar result. I won't go into this because Benjo's result is basically a clone of a result from the 80s uh, and somewhat not very interesting. Anyway, the analysis of depth uh, of arithmetic circuits is still very much a research problem, but the general concept that I've just conveyed still holds. So, but Let's try to see this from a more practical perspective. Let's look at examples. Uh, let's look at somewhat of a worst case decision boundary. And I'm going to use threshold activation networks, which will generalize to other activation functions. Consider the simple function over here. I want this decision boundary. I want ones in all the yellow regions and zeros outside. So I want the classifier, the classifier to fire if the input is in any of the yellow regions. And as we just saw, if I want to model this using infinite, a single hidden layer, I could require infinite neurons in the one hidden layer. But then, if, I want, if I'm willing to do this using two layers, suddenly I can do this with only 56 neurons. So where did the number 56 suddenly pop up from? This pattern is entirely composed of 16 lines, eight of these lines and eight of these lines. So I need 16 neurons to capture each one of these 16 lines. And then subsequently in the next layer, I'm using these layers to compose these yellow, yellow regions. And there are 50, uh, 40 of these yellow regions. So I need 40 neurons in the second layer to compose each of the yellow regions. And then and I need the R. So the total is 16 neurons in the first layer, 40 in the hidden, second hidden layer, and the final one. To, so I can compose this using. 57 neurons. Now, but then if I want to go deeper, it turns out that this pattern is simply an XOR of all of these lines. And once I realize that this is just an XOR, I can build it like so. So which means that the XOR in this case, in this case it's the XOR is going to need, uh, there are 15, 16 lines, so I have 15 XORs. And 15 XORs that will require not actually 45, but 30 neurons. So I could do this using 46 neurons. But then if I went to a more complex pattern like this one, uh, again, if I want to do this using one hidden layer, it's going to take an arbitrarily large number of neurons in the hidden layer. But if I'm willing to take two hidden layers, 
I can just have 64 neurons in the first layer, right? Because there are 64 lines. And then there are 544 of these little yellow boxes. So I need the 544 neurons in the second layer. And then the final neuron over here, I can do this whole thing using 609 neurons in two layers. But if I'm willing to take more layers, this is just an XOR network. So this is going to be 64 plus 63 times 2, which is 126 plus 64, 126, 130, 190 neurons. Or if I use three neurons for an XOR, it'll take, it requires 253 neurons. So you get the idea. As you know, the, uh, if I consider deeper networks, deeper networks can, can compose the same decision boundaries using far fewer neurons as the patterns get more and more complex. Now in the problem, the two layer network was actually quadratic in the number of lines. Earlier I said that when I, when, I need, when I want to compose an XOR, I need an exponential number of neurons. So where was the difference? The, the, I mean, there seems to be some, 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 some word of a uh, gap between the two statements. Uh, it's not really a paradox. In this case, the data are two dimensional. So, so the individual classifiers are somewhat correlated, meaning if I'm to the left of this line, it means I'm also to the left of this line. I'm also to the left of every other line to the right of it. So the individual decisions are all, all, are all related. And so as a result, the actual number of neurons is still only quadratic if I use only two layers. But for the more general case of n mutually intersecting hyperplanes in d dimensions, you're going to require order n raised to d over d minus 1 factorial weights. And if I assume that the, the uh, dimensionality of the input, if I assume that the dimensionality of the input is much greater than the depth. So in general, increasing the input dimensions can increase the worst case size of shallower networks exponentially. But the XOR network, which becomes deeper, is still going to remain very small. So the number of neurons required in a shallow network is poly polynomial in the number of basic patterns. It's exponential in the dimensionality of the input in the worst case, if I want to use a shallow network. On the other hand, if I'm willing to make it deep, the network can survive with far, far, far fewer neurons. And so going back to our story so far, multilayer perceptrons are universal classification functions. Even a network with a single hidden layer is a universal classifier. But a single layer network may require an exponentially large number of perceptrons. Uh, deeper networks may require exponentially fewer neurons than a shallower network to express the same function. In other words, deeper networks are more expressive. When we think of continuous valued regressions, I already showed you how a multilayer perceptron can model an arbitrary uh, function, scalar function of a scalar input. And the way we did it was to compose this little square rectangle and then we could patch a bunch of these rectangles together and model any scalar function with approximate with, uh, with arbitrary precision uh, where the accuracy only depended on how many neurons you actually used to model the entire function. But how would I use the same idea for higher dimensions? That too is easy. We know that a multilayer perceptron can model a cylinder. And once I know I can model a cylinder, then I can take, and in fact, by adding this bias term, the cylinder is going to be n over 2 in the center and 0 outside. Now, now that I can model a cylinder, I can model an arbitrary function of any number of inputs by composing many cylinders, scaling their heights to different values, and adding them up. So basically, I'm fitting uh, any function approximating any n approximate function by fitting an arbitrary number of cylinders under it. And I can make the approximation arbitrarily precise by making the cylinders narrower and increasing the number of cylinders. So in other words, the multilayer perceptron is a universal approximator. It can approximate any function. The overall gist of this, uh, yes. So uh, the point is the 
that the reason is when I do the square, the sum outside the square is actually not going to be uniform. So you cannot compose a square where the sum inside the square is n and everywhere outside the square it's n over 2. So those things intersect and you're going to get crazy boundaries. Whereas I had to go all the way to a cylinder to make sure that I had two distinct regions, one where the sum was n and n over 2 and the other where the sum was 0. I can't do it with squares. Yes. Any, anything else? Any other question? No? Okay. So, let's get back. Okay, so, uh, so here is the overall thing. A single layer MLP is a universal function approximator. It can approximate any function to arbitrary precision, but may require infinite neurons in the layer. More generally, deeper networks will require far fewer net neurons for the same approximation error. So the network is a generic map. And the same principles that apply for Boolean networks uh, apply here. And as I increase the depth, the number of neurons I requ requ that I require to model any function can become exponentially smaller. But there's more to it than that. There's this notion of sufficiency of architecture. Consider this little figure. This figure we saw could be comp uh, computed using just a two-layer MLP, where I had 16 neurons in the first layer and I had 40 neurons on the second layer. With these two together, I could compose this little figure. But then, suppose I have only eight neurons in the first layer, assuming I'm using threshold functions for my activation. So that's a, that's a hint. So here, so if I have only eight neurons in the first layer, can I still get the same function can I still get the same function by simply increasing the number of neurons in the second layer? Anyone? It should work? So, no. Mm -hmm. And why would that be? So consider this. So let's say I have only eight neurons in the first layer. I'm using threshold activations. If I have eight neurons, each of these is going to capture maybe a line of this kind. And what these neurons are telling me is whether the input is on one side of the line or not. So these eight neurons together give me this kind of information. This first neuron will tell me whether it's to the right of this line or to the left. The second neuron will tell me whether it's to the right of the second line or the left. But between those two lines, I have no information about how far I am from the individual lines. So by the time I get to the second layer, the information is already lost. There's no way for me to add extra information about what happened between the lines. So in this case, for example, if these eight neurons captured these lines, there's no way I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to be able to, uh, uh, to do anything in the second layer which gives me the, the uh, lines that are per perpendicular to it. Or even if these eight neurons gave me these eight lines, within each of these boxes, I have no information about the gradation of the input. And because I don't have any information about the gradation of the input, there's no way I will be able to make further distinctions to distinguish between these four little boxes. So as a result, a neural network can represent any function provided it has sufficient capacity, which means it must be sufficiently broad and sufficiently deep to represent the function, and not all architectures can represent any function. Now, suppose I actually go ahead and give you uh, 16 neurons in the first layer, but I give you less than 40 neurons in the second layer. Can I, now com can, can, can I now compose the same function? And the answer is still no, because I have 40 boxes. I need 40 neurons in the second layer. So overall, the so I am sort of repeating myself. The, so, so overall, you absolutely, the, the only way you're going to be able to compose the structure to, is to have at least 16 neurons in the first layer and at least 40 in the second layer. And the reason for this is because I use the threshold activation. The threshold activation gates the input 
from each layer before it gets to the next one. So this first, first neuron over here, if I had only four, four neurons, is simply going to tell me whether I'm to the right of this unit or to the left, but doesn't give me any further information. This second guy will similarly tell me whether I'm to the right of the second line or to the left, but doesn't give me any further information, and so on. So within each of these, once you get past this neuron out here, the output pattern of these four neurons is identical within each of these colored regions. And as a result, the next layer doesn't have sufficient information to recreate the lost patterns. But then, instead of a threshold function, suppose I use a sigmoid of this kind, then something interesting happens. Because when I use a sigmoid, then the, the color over here is no longer uniform, it's actually graded. Which means that the output of this neuron does have a linear, some kind of boundary, but it does also tell me how far away from the boundary I really am. And as a result, if I use a continuous activation function of this kind, then the, I still get sufficient information at the next layer for me to be able to compensate or the insufficient number of neurons in the lower layer and compose the decision boundaries. So the gradation provides information to subsequent layers to compose the information missed by the lower layer. It passes information to subsequent layers. Now this gives us a hint that you really want these activations to be as graded as possible so that if your lower layers are insufficiently wide, the subsequent layers can catch the information. And what is the most graded, by, you know, what is the most graded input you can possibly have? Something that's linear. So we are still looking for non-linearity. So we want to be able to say, here is a boundary. I want the response on one side of the boundary to be of one kind, on the other side of the boundary to, to be of the other kind. But I want to retain the maximum gradation. And from that perspective, it turns out that the most useful activation you can actually get is something of this kind, which is not even necessarily a ReLU but something that has an, as a hinge over here and has lines of two different kinds. And that's because this one actually not only captures the line, linear boundary, but also carries information forward to subsequent layers so that they can make up for the information missed by the lower layers. So in the width versus uh, uh, activation versus depth, narrow layers can still pass information to subsequent layers if the act activation function is sub uh, sufficiently graded, but will require greater depth to permit later layers to capture more, more patterns. And uh, so this means that the network architecture really needs to have sufficient uh, capacity. The problem, of course, is that the descriptions I have are kind of hand-waving. If you try to get formal, it's really uh, very hard to define the capacity of a network. There are various definitions, information or storage capacity, VC dimensions. Uh, from our perspective, we can just say the largest number of disconnected convex regions it can represent. In general, a network with insufficient capacity cannot exactly model a function that requires a, that requires a greater minimal number of convex hulls in the capacity of the network. And I won't actually get into the, to, to the uh, discussions about what network capacity is. So, Lessons so far, MLPs are universal Boolean functions, they're universal classifiers, they're universal function approximators. A single layer MLP can approximate anything to arbitrary precision. Uh, deeper MLPs can achieve the same precision with far fewer neurons. And having non-threshold activations, something that should have been on the slide, but something that is graded, particularly in the lower layers of the network, is much more useful than simply having a threshold. And the greater the degree of gradation, the more useful it is to carry information forward that lets the subsequent regions of the network operate on it. Uh, questions? No? OK. So what we've spoken of so far is what a network can model. And as I promised early on today, that's the kind of information, that is the level at which I was going to talk. I'm not really going to get into the depths of how you would model it, but there's one aspect that we do need to take, and take into consideration. We said the neural network can approximate any function, but only if the function is known a priori. So if I know the function has this shape, 
that can, then I can compose a network for that chip. But in reality, what happens? In reality, what happens is that we are not really given the function shape. We are given input-output pairs. We are given examples. So basically, you'd be in given information of this kind. You know, at this value of the input, this is the output. At this value of the input, this is the output, and so on. You're given sev several of this kind. And from that, you want to deduce a function that captures this shape. But what you're really seeing is just this guy. And you want to learn the f entire function from just these fellows. And so the way you would do it is you compose, de define the structure of your network. Hopefully, your network has sufficient capacity to model the function. And for any given setting of the parameters of the network, it's going to make mistakes. So maybe the actual output is less than what you want it to be, or maybe more than what you want it to be. So at each of these points, the network is going to make mistakes. And you can define an error, which is the total error it's making over all of the training samples. And we learn the parameters of the network to minimize this error. When we do that, we hope that it will capture this little grid. In reality, that's not what happens. In reality, again, keep in mind that you're only providing input-output pairs. So what you're really doing is giving this red dot and saying the output is out here. This is what the output must be. This is the input. This is what the output must be, and so on. And you're hoping it will capture this dotted blue line. But you're as likely as not to end up capturing this crazy red curve instead. So although you're capturing the correct relationship at the training instances, at the rest of the network, all bets are off. Uh, uh, the rest of the input space, all bets are off. And to see how bad it is, you must consider the fact that in the truth is that we never, ever, 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 ever provide sufficient training data. Why is that? Consider a network that is trying to cap that is working on binary 100-dimensional inputs, like a network that's working on images of 10 cross 10, where every pixel is either black or white. So it's a very, very simple network. So each possible input is a 100-bit binary pattern, which means all the inputs live on the corners of a 100-dimensional hypercube. To completely specify this function, you have to specify the function at every single corner of this hypercube. That means you have to provide 10 raised to 30 values to completely specify this function. Now consider that you actually provide the function 1,000 trillion training instances, 10 raised to 15 training instances. No one has ever seen what 1,000 trillion training instances look like. I don't believe that number exists in modern databases. But somehow, let's say magically, we've actually managed to provide 1,000 trillion training instances. Guess what? You still haven't provided any training data because you're actually off by a factor of 10 raised to 15 to completely specify the function. You're literally providing, after providing 1,000 trillion training instances for this little problem, you're literally providing one out of 1,000 trillion values that you really should be specifying to completely specify the function. So to put it differently, Let's say I just threw my 1,000 trillion training instances on this hypercube. And then I randomly placed a little spaceship on one of these corners. And I let the spaceship travel at any finite speed along, but it's only allowed to travel along the edges of the cube. The universe would end before the spaceship found the next training instance you gave it. That's how sparse the data you give it are. If I work my way back in terms of training instances per dimension, what you're really providing is slightly more than one training instance per dimension. You're literally giving it this one dot and saying, find the function. And you can see how absurd that even begins to sound. Uh, there are two raised to 100 corners to this cube, which is 10 raised to 30. Right. So. Now, how does depth factor into this? NLPs, the only way you can actually specify this function is to say that the value over here is somehow related to the values in the neighboring corners. So you need some smoothness constraints. And NLPs, it turns out, impose constraints. They are universal approximators. If you give them 10, you know, 1,000 trillion training instances, they can just capture, they can 
compute any one of an infinitely, almost infinitely large number of functions that would capture the input output relationship correctly and not be the one, one function that you want. So you need additional constraints. And turns out that having deeper networks impose constraints, smoothness constraints. And why is that? Having shallow but uh, having narrow but deep networks imposes constraints. And that's because when you have a network that's in many layers, each layer is composing, a, is learning a very simple function. And the next layer is working on the simple function that has been learned by the earlier layer. So you are getting, it's just making the network layer you know, deep imposes a hierarchy, basically a recursion of smoothness constraints, which makes the output quite smooth. And that is much more likely to capture a reasonable function over your training instances. So here is a little example of how that actually works out. Uh, these are two dimensional examples where I want the output to be one in the white region and zero outside. Now in this case, using the little example that I showed you earlier, I know I can compose this using four, five, six, seven, eight neurons exactly. But then if I build a network of the optimal architecture and give it a thousand training instances drawn from this figure, and then use every trick known to mankind to train my network, here is the decision boundary it actually learns. Nothing like what I want. Same thing over here. This is the garbage that it learns. This is an optimal network of the optimal architecture. So, but then, uh, let me take a much larger number of networks. Now I'm training, training a network with far greater capacity. So you expect it to learn even more meaningless functions, but then arrange them in different ways. So here is, this is one example. Here is the decision boundary I'm trying to capture. And in this case, I've used 660 neurons and 1,000 training instances. If I arrange those 660 neurons in three layers of 220 neurons each, this is the decision boundary it finds. If I have four layers of 115, this is what it finds. Six layers of 110, this is what it finds. 11 layers of 60, this is what it finds. So it's still the same number of neurons, but as I make them deeper as opposed to wide, you can find that, learn, see that it's actually beginning to learn a meaningful shape. Now, keep in mind that I have provided a thousand training instances over two dimensional input. This is absurd. This never happens in real life. Your typical training data, you know, thousand training instances for two dimensional input is probably, you know, too many orders of magnitude, at least three orders of magnitude too high. Keep in mind that your input are much larger dimensions and in terms of Training instances per dimension, you typically have like one training instance per dimension. Anyway, here is a different decision boundary. And once again, as I make the network deeper, it learns this bear better and better. Also, if I have more training instances, it does a better job. So uh, deeper networks seem to learn better for the same number of total neurons because you have implicit smoothness constraints. And Another nice thing is similar functions are not learnable using most usual pattern recognition methods. You can bunch, try a bunch of other standard uh, regression models and you will find that you can't actually learn these decision boundaries. So the fact that it's a universal approximator is actually a pretty good thing, but the truth is that provided the right uh, training tricks, the right training data and the right architectures, you're actually able to learn these crazy decision boundaries. So I'm going to move on to part three of this talk which is about 45 minutes worth. If you have any questions about everything that I've covered so far, yes. Um, <clears throat> just, I'm a little bit confused when you say training instances. Are you just giving, you, you have the image already given That's of the, the boundary that you want? Those are decision boundaries. So I can yeah. actually, I can randomly select a thousand points from that, from ah, that region. Okay. So, but how big was your image? If you're, if you're giving 10,000 training instances? That's, it's, those are real valued, remember. So it's, a, you know, even if it's just one cross one, it has an uncountable infinity of uh, points in okay. there. Okay. Right. Anyone else? Uh-huh. 
Sorry, in the previous uh, slide, you said that if we have more uh, layers, we will have a better approximation for boundaries. Uh, with the same number of uh, neurons, it means that we have less number of neurons in uh, lower uh, layers. Every layer. So this is, uh, in this case, it's a bit of a, uh, I'm hiding a little bit of information. If you, you should be counting the number of parameters, but uh, the same idea still holds that if I distribute the para same number of parameters in depth as opposed to width, I get a better approximation. So here in this case, uh, I have 11 layers. Each layer has only 60 neurons. Here I have three layers. Each layer has 220 neurons. But uh, uh, you said that if, uh, the, the, uh, lower, uh, lower layers may propagate more may information to upper layers. So if you have the less neurons in lower layers, it means that we have less information propagated to Again, this layers. is, uh, if, I, if I use a threshold unit, that is correct. I'm not using threshold units. Uh -huh. I mentioned that, I've, you know, if you have graded units, then the information does get forwarded. Okay. So Thank the you. lesson over here is you really want to make these neurons, the networks narrow and tall and, and deep, but then you, but then you want your, uh, the, the neurons themselves to carry, send as much information as possible downstream. So if I were using sigmoids, sigmoids lose a lot of information once you get past the sigmoidal range. The sigmoids would not work. Mm -hmm. In this case, I'm actually using uh, leaky relus, which means I have graded gradation on both sides, which allows me to propagate information downstream. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, a little bit of a speculative question, and maybe you uh, won't be able to answer, but still. So we started to talk by talking about the, the inspiration uh, that comes from cognition. And, and I was, so here we are talking about uh, the problem of, of data spartanness and uh, how does this affect the structure? So do we have a clue uh, of the depth of the connections in the human brain or like how, human how brains yes and no right uh, and what, what is the capacity of, of a human brain processing based on like architectures so, so I can't answer the question about the capacity simply because I don't remember it but then there have been various estimates that people have come up with and I think that each estimate is as good a guess as something that you can randomly pull out of your head but you can't really compare these structures to what's in the brain for a very simple reason these structures are directional strictly feed forward and in the neuron, you have lots and lots of structure where the output of a network comes, of a unit comes back to itself after a while, even with no additional input. You have loopy connections in the brain. So, so they're not strict, directly comparable. Anybody else? Okay. So the final part, what does the network really learn after all of this? We've saw a scene what it can learn, we've learned some of the, some of the limitations, depth versus width, et cetera. But what does it really learn? And so here's the problem again. We are given a collection of input-output pairs. We have to learn the function. Now let's start off with a simple problem that we've seen earlier, this double pentagon. So this is the function we want to learn. You want it to be one inside the pentagons, zero outside. You wouldn't actually be given this double pentagon. You would expect to be given uh, you know, training instances, all the reds inside the double pentagon, all the blues outside, and uh, we must learn the decision boundaries that separate these red and blue classes. Now, this is all very nice and sweet. The truth is that things are not going to be so cleanly separated. What you're really going to get is something like this. You will see a few blues inside the red regions. You will see a few reds inside the blue regions. And from this data, you have to learn this decision boundary. So it's a lot messier than it looks like. And to understand this, how exact, what actually happens when we try to learn something of this kind, let's back off to the most simple model that you can think of, which is a single perceptron. Then a single perceptron, we've already seen this several times. Uh, you're, you, a single perceptron in the two-dimensional case learns the step function. In an n-dimensional input case, it learns an, you know, a step function in, in, in n dimensions. And uh, it's basically a step across a hyperplane. But you wouldn't actually get this function. What you're going to get is a bunch of training instances of this kind. Basically, you're going to get some blue dots on this region of the plane and some red dots on this region of the plane. So from the top, it would look like this. And you have to learn the function using just these training instances. 
assuming that the training instances are not merged up. So we are looking, starting off by looking at a nice simple example where the reds have their own region and the blues have their own region. So if I want to learn the perceptron, I want to learn a function of this kind. I want to see, I want to come learn a bunch of weights and a bias such that the weighted sum of inputs minus the bias is greater than 0 in all of the regions which are where, which contain red points and less than 0 in all of the regions which contain blue points. And you are going to learn this, you are given all of these training instances, several x, y pairs. Now a little bit of change of far terminology just for the purpose of illustration. I do not really need to explicitly model a threshold, I can just instead augment my input with an extra 1 and that bias simply becomes an extra weight. Now the reason to, for me to do that is that you know now I can actually write the whole thing in this manner. The output of the perceptron is going to be 1 if the weighted combination of inputs is greater than a threshold, greater than 0 and 1 otherwise. So this hyperplane now goes through origin. And so here is what we are trying to learn in this case. We are trying to learn the hyperplane such that all the red dots are on one side of the hyperplane and all the blue dots are on the other side of the hyperplane. And this hyperplane is completely represented by this weights vector which is orthogonal to the hyperplane. The simple, most simple training algorithm that we have for this, we are all familiar with this. This is the perceptron training algorithm. You would be given a bunch of training instances x1, y1, x2, y2 all the way through xn, yn where we are going to assume that the y is either plus 1 or minus 1. This is simply for convenience that the training, the data either belong to a positive class or they belong to a negative class. And the perceptron algorithm cycles through the training instances. It only updates the weights on the misclassified instances. So as you cycle through the training, training instances, you are going to apply it using the correct current classifier. If the instance is misclassified, you add the instance to the weights vector. If it's, a, if it's in the positive class, if the instance belongs to the negative class, you subtract the instance from the weights vector. Geographic, I mean geometrically what's happening? So I say, let's say these are my red dots and red dots and my blue dots and I want to learn a classifier. I can just start off with some random initial uh, weights vector which gives me the decision boundary which is perpendicular to the weights vector. And now I begin cycling through the training instances. Obviously, this decision boundary is making all kinds of horrible mistakes. So now I begin cycling through the training instances and I find that, this is my initialization, I find that if my blues are the positive instances, I find that the, this blue vector is misclassified, right? So this blue vector is misclassified, that is the blue vector. So what I will do is because it is a positive instance, I am going to add it to the weights vector. So when I add it to the weights vector, the weights vector now becomes this blue line. And when the weights vector becomes this blue line, the decision boundary is now perpendicular to this weights vector. That becomes the decision boundary and it is going to call everything on this side blue and everything on this side red. But now using this decision boundary, this instance is misclassified. This is from the negative class. So that is the vector. Because it is from a negative class, I am going to subtract it. And when I subtract it, this is my new weights vector and that is going to be my new decision boundary. And now it is perfect classification, no more updates. So what are we doing here? We are always dragging the weights vector towards the positive instances because if the weights vector points at a positive instance, then it is going to put the positive instance, instance on the correct sides of the plane. You are pushing it away from the negative instances because if a weights vector points exactly away from a negative instance, once again, the negative instance is on the, on the correct side of the plane. And we keep doing this until you get perfect classification. And if the classes are linearly separable, then you can show, it is fairly trivial to prove that this entire algorithm is going to converge in no more than r over gamma squared misclassifications. We do not really need to worry about what r and gamma are. R is the length of the longest training point, gamma is the best case margin, the, the margin on a support vector machine. Basically intuitively you are taking many increments of size gamma to an, uh, undo an error resulting from a step of size r, doesn't matter. The point is this is guaranteed to give you a correct decision boundary in a finite number of steps. The reality is you are not going to get nice 
cleanly separated training instances and the perceptron algorithm and all of these other algorithms only are only guaranteed to work if the data are separable. What you will get is something more of this kind. You're going to get some reds on the blue side. These are supposed to be blue. They turned out green. I don't know why. You get some blues on the red side. So if I were to look at it in three dimensions, I have some reds hanging above the blues. I have some blues living below the reds. And now I have to learn the classifier. Uh, so let's look at it in one dimension. In one dimension, this is what your training data are going to look like. You have lots of blue data, you have lots of red data, but then you have these regions where both blues and reds occur. So what kind of perceptron could I learn? The perceptron now has to learn a threshold somewhere. Where exactly is it going to learn the threshold? Now clearly it can't learn any threshold which perfectly separates the blues from the reds. Now if I used a multilayer perceptron with many, many neurons, I can learn something of this kind which goes up and down and up and down in this ugly, hideous fashion and can perfectly nail every single training instance. But is this really what we want? This is not what we want. And even if you were happy with something like this, the actual situation is, I can give you some, a situation such as this one where I have reds and blues at exactly the same point. So in this case, what do I want the output of my perceptron or more generally of my classifier to be? So in the, over here, what I can, let's say I have many instances at this one point and let's say I have 90 instances over here and 10 instances of, 90 instances of red and 10 instances of blue. What do I want the output of the single perceptron to be? Do I want it to be red because the majority are red or do I want it to be 0.9? It just tells me that 90% of the instances are red. This 0.9 is more informative. The 0.9 makes a lot more sense. So, so what we really want is this value, this guy, which is the estimate of the probability of 1 given x, which is this position. This is potentially much more useful than a simple 1, 0 decision. And potentially also much more realistic as what we want the network to actually produce. But now, let me add just a little bit of jitter. So now all the red points are over here and the blue points are an epsilon, tiny, 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 tiny epsilon away. Do I, do I want my decision to completely change? Now do I want this wiggle? That doesn't make sense. They're very close, right? I really want them to, even in this case, if they're just slightly off from one another, I still want to get the same output. I want to get, at this, in this region, I want to get P of 1 given x. Basically, I want to get a value of this kind. So here's a different way of looking at this. At each point, look at a small window about that point. Plot the average value of the uh, average y value within that window. So here it's going to be uh, 0. And then let me slide this forward. And as I keep going forward, at each point I'm plotting the average y value. And the average y value is going to go like this. This is an approximation of the probability of 1 given x at each value of x. And this is the function that I really want to capture. This gives me a much more useful and much more realistic idea of what is really happening. So this function is very well modeled by the sigmoid that, you're, the, the, the sigmoid that we're all very familiar with. So class 1 becomes increasingly probable going left to right, which is very typical in many problems. And this can be modeled using a simple logistic perceptron where the activation is simply the logistic function instead of the threshold. And so a sigmoid perceptron with this logistic function models the a posteriori probability of the class given the input. In the two-dimensional example, so that was for the one-dimensional example. Suppose I went to two dimensions where the input lies in two dimensions. Now I have reds on one side, blues on the other side, but then I have some reds on the blue side, some blues on the red side. So no line, no hyperplane will cleanly separate the two colors. But then if I actually use a uh, sigmoidal activation, a logistic regression, then this is, this, this is what the function will actually learn, something of this kind. 
which once again gives me the probability of y equals 1 given the two dimensional x at each point. And if I, I can use a threshold on this a posteriori probability and for any given threshold the decision boundary is going to be aligned. But anyway, the function, the actual function that you learn now is the probability of one given x. Now I will skip the bit about estimating the model but it turns out that estimating the model ends up looking exactly like, like uh, uh, I mean it is going to require gradient descent which is one component of back propagation, right. But that was for a linear classifier where I had a single hyperplane separating the positives and the negatives. What if I want something of this kind where I have reds, uh, where I have blues in the red region and reds in the blue region but the decision boundary I want is complicated like this two pentagons. First let us try this look at the simple trivial case. In the trivial case let us say the classes are perfectly separable. There are no blues in the red region, no reds in the blue region and the net must learn to classify. Let us look at the optimal network. So I have one network for the lower pentagon, another one for the upper pentagon and these two guys are going to going to a final perceptron. But then what is this final perceptron? This final perceptron is a linear classifier. It is either a sigmoid or a threshold function. It is a linear classifier, right? So for this perceptron to be able to perfectly separate the reds from the blues, this means that at this point the reds and the blues must be linearly separable. So in other words, if I look at this portion of the network, when I feed this pattern into the network, for each point I am going to get a y1, y2 pair and if I plot all the y1s and y2s, the red y1s and the blue y, the red y's and the blue y's must be perfectly linearly separable for this final perceptron to be able to separate them out. So what is really happening over here is that this network can be thought of the low, the rest of the network except for the final perceptron just the rest of the network below it can be thought of as a transformation that takes this non these non-linear classes and moves them around such that they now become linearly separable so that you can apply a perceptron on it and learn a linearly separable cl a linear classifier. So this actually does not need to be a perceptron. It can be any linear classifier. It does not have to be a logistic function. It could be a support vector machine. You can have a support vector machine on top of this. You can have one portion of the network which is learning the features that are linearly separable. And you know we know that when you have linearly separable classes, SVMs are generally more robust than logistic regression or simple perceptrons. So this one could be an SVM and you could actually train the entire classifier to, to, to using the loss function used for SVMs. Now this was for the optimal network. It does not even need to be uh, just uh, an optimal network. It can be any sufficient structure. What do I mean by sufficient structure? It can be any structure that is capable of performing this classification. So I could add these extra connections to the other side and this is a sufficient structure for this classifier. And for any sufficient structure, this portion of the network is actually learning to transform these classes into being linearly separable. And this guy is performing a linear classification. And you could actually just use any linear classification rule to learn the network. Now what if you have insufficient networks over here? So you, your network does not have a sufficient number of neurons to actually capture this classification boundary properly. In this case the network may attempt to, tra attempt to transform the inputs to linearly separable features. It won't be fully uh, successful but still for binary problems you know some using like something like an SVM may be more effective than just using a simple logistic regression. These are all various options but the point is that this portion of the network, the network comprises two portions. One is a linear classifier the other is the portion of the network that transforms this ugly input into something that can be linearly separated. Now, so mathematically, what is this guy actually doing? 
this guy is actually computing if I used a sigmoid at the output this guy is going to be computing the posterior probabilities uh, that that actually uh, that actually uh, uh, compute the posterior posterior probabilities of the two classes now so this is going to operate this is a logistic regression that operates in the space of y's where the data are almost linearly separable and the network until the second to last layer is a nonlinear function that converts the input space of x into the feature space y that are maximally linearly separable so the story so far a classification mlp actually comprises two components a feature extraction network that converts the inputs into linearly separable features or nearly linearly separable features and a final classifier that operates on these separable features. So what about the lower layers? What happens in these lower layers? We know that at the y's this entire network until here operates on the input and makes them linearly separable. But what happens below it? They too compute features and how do they look for the manifold hypothesis is that for separable classes the classes are linearly separable on a non-linear manifold and that the lower layers slowly linearize this manifold they unfold it and stretch it out such that the final classifier can actually work on it now it also show you can also show that if the if the activation functions of these neurons are idempotent which means that if you apply the same activation function twice instead of only once the output remains the same then you can show that as you go from the bottom to the top of the network the classes become increasingly linearly separable so here is how the uh, network actually behaves I can let me see if this it's trying to learn this circular decision boundary as you go from the left to the right observe what happens first you add a bias this has this network has only two layers so first as you add a bias it's shifting this circle into three dimensions and 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 uh, tilting it at an angle the subsequent tan h function bulges out the blue and pushes out the red at the next layer the red and the blue now fall out separately and now i can classify a simple threshold will cut off the red from the blue so the actual decision boundary learned is this guy so you can see how this as the network trains it actually ends up making the classes linearly separable pushing all the reds to one side and all the blues to the other side uh, here's the same thing for a more complex task this is for CIFAR this, uh, this activation this uh, video is too fast but as you go from this network has nine layers and uh, you're trying to learn the various classes it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big network we've uh, taken one of the uh, yeah. hidden layers and uh, actually the penultimate layer and uh, projected it down to two dimensions using PCA and you can see what happens that actually this is after each layer and you can see that as you go through the layers the classes become more and more linearly separable let me play this again as you train the classes become more and more linearly separable till they actually end up fully separated I can the same thing now when I'm when I uh, pro, when I project it into three dimensions using PCA for visualization you can see how this actually becomes very clear each of the classes ends up in a different plane and now the whole thing becomes very cleanly linearly separable so what happens is that as you go through the network the network makes the classes increasingly linearly separable such that the final layer can actually separate the classes cleanly using a linear classifier now when the data are not separable and the boundaries are not linear which is this is a setting which is more ty more typical for most classification bound problems then what really happens is that the feature extraction layer transforms the data such that the posterior probabilities of the classes can now be modeled by a logistic and the final uh, so basically it puts the entire uh, data into a sp into a space of this kind where a decision boundary is linear and the final uh, output logistic computes the posterior probability of the class given the input so the output of the network now is going to be at each point the probability of the red class 
given the point. For multi class networks, it will be a vector of a posteriori probabilities for the various classes. So, this was a quick sort of uh, view into trying to visualize what the network is actually doing, but then you know everything I say might, might be completely wrong. There is a beautiful book called Illusions by Richard Bach, where in the final chapter he says everything in the book might be wrong. You know, so, and this holds, because there is no such thing as inseparable classes in most situations. I can always draw crazy decision boundaries of this kind. And whether this is something you really want or not is a matter of choice. We don't really, we, we can never really be sure what the correct answer is. And a sufficiently detailed architecture can separate nearly any arrangement of points. So the correctness of the suggested intuitions are subject to various parameters, such as what you want from the data and things like regularization, detail, training paradigm, convergence, etc. So I'm going to switch gears for a bit. But any questions? No. Okay, so here's the final piece of my talk. We've seen what the network learns here, but what are the features that it learns? At the very first layer, what are the features that it learns? Recall the basic perceptron. It's just going to fire if the weighted combination of inputs exceeds the threshold, or it can use a sigma. But let's continue and also recall that what, what the basic perceptron is really doing is looking at the inner product between the weights and the input and checking if the input input is close enough an angle to the weights vector. So when we consider the, consider the weights as a template, so, so, so when you think of it, you can think of the weights as a template and it's really matching the input to the weights. And if the correlation between the input and the weights exceeds a threshold, it's going to fire. If it's below a threshold, it's not going to fire. So the perceptron we saw was a correlation filter. So in a typical setup, you would expect the first layer of neurons to detect significant features in the input, which I'm calling the signal in this case. And in fact, since these are feature detectors, you can actually recompose or try to recompose the input based on these features. So for example, this guy may say I found a horizontal line. This guy may say I found a vertical line. These guys may say I didn't find these patterns. So from this, I know that the input has one horizontal line here, one vertical line here, and doesn't have all of these lines. So I can use these, the, the, the outcomes of these detectors to try to recompose the input and I will end up recomposing the significant portions of the input, whatever was useful for me to, uh, for, for, for this particular classification task. So in other words, these features, just being able to detect these features gives me on some handle on knowing what the input really looks like. I can recompose it. Let me make that most, more explicit. Let me explicitly try to say, I'm going to detect some features then I'm going to recompose them. Basically, this said this particular combination of weights happened, right? So I'm going to say, please put this combination of weights in the input. This guy said this combination of weights happened. So I'm going to say, please also put this combination of weights into the input. So I can take the outputs of these feature detectors and recompose the detected features to reconstruct the input. And if I make this explicit and say, build a network of this kind which takes some inputs, finds some features and then can exactly recompose the input from these features, we get what is called an autoencoder. Now in this particular problem, you know, if, if I just try to directly use these features to reconstruct the input, I won't be able to do it because this network, the way I described it was optimized to recognize digits and it will only retain distinctly digit-like or non-digit-like features. The rest are irrelevant and will be lost. But then if I make it explicit saying and saying, you know, train the network to reproduce the input itself, I get an autoencoder which will actually learn to reconstruct the input. So this has two portions. I have an encoder which learns to detect all the most significant patterns in the input. And I have a decoder which recomposes the input from all of these detected patterns. So to understand how this thing works, 
Now this is learning how autoencoders work is, is it provides us a very nice insight into what the uh, network actually learns as features. So this is a very useful exercise. So to see how the whole thing works, let's take a very simple example, a single unit. So there's an input, there's a single hidden unit, and there's an output. And yes. Not necessary, as you will see. Right? So, uh, but here, let's assume that I'm, but if you think of it as recomposing the same features, then it, then it makes sense to think of it as having the transposed weight matrices, but it's really not required. So let's consider this very simple situation. I have just a single hidden unit, and I'm going to make it even simpler. I'm going to say that the hidden unit only has a linear activation. It's just going to produce the weighted combination of inputs, and I'm going to use that to reactivate the weights. So now, if I try to learn this unit, what will I be doing? I will be trying to learn this unit, namely learning these weights, such that the error between the actual output here and the input I provide is minimized. So I'm going to be, and if I define this error as the squared error, the, the L2 error, I'm going to be looking at the uh, uh, weighted, uh, uh, the, the squared error between x and the output x hat, and x hat is because this activation is linear, the x hat is simply w x, w transpose times w times x, right? And so I'm try, I would be trying to find the weights that minimize the expected value of this divergence. And this optimization we are very familiar with. This is just principal component analysis. So in this case, if I just use a single, single uh, autoencoder with a single linear unit, what I would really be performing is just finding the direction of maximum energy in the signal, or if the input is zero mean random variable, we're finding the direction of maximum variance. So basically, if these are all the in inputs, it's going to find this little principal axis, and it's going to put all of the data points on this principal axis. What do I mean by that? I mean that if I give it for any input that I give it, look at the decoder. The decoder has is taking a single output. It's going to be taking just the output of this guy and exciting this weight pattern. So the output is going to be some scaled value of this weights vector. So the output is always going to lie on a single, single line because it's just a single weights vector. So no matter what this value is, the output is going to lie somewhere on this blue line. And so this entire structure is going to try to find this line such that if you just zap all inputs onto this line, the total error is minimized. This is just PCA. We're, we're all familiar with this. This is just if I have only one unit. What happens when I have a whole bank of units? So here, the, and I'm still assuming that the units are linear. So when I have just a whole bank of units, the output of this hidden layer is just w, trans, w times x, where w is the weights matrix, x is the input. The output is w transpose times y, which is w transpose times w times x. The error is the difference between the two. The squared error is what I have given here. I can try to find the weights w to minimize the average squared error. This is still just PCA. We are familiar with this. So what would, what would be happening over here? The output of the hidden layer is going to be the in the principal subspace. And even if I change these, this weight matrix and no, not have it be the transpose of W, it's still going to, I'm, at this point, I'm still going to be finding just, the, just a position in the principal subspace of, of, um, of the data. So I can introduce some terminology over here. I can, I can dec decompose this model into two components. One is the encoder, which is the analysis net, which computes the hidden representation, and the decoder, which is the synthesis net, which recomposes the data from the hidden representation. And so now, if the hidden layer has a linear activation, then if I, as I vary the value of the input, these y's are going to change.
But when I change these y's, the output is always going to be going to lie on the subspace represented by this weights matrix. So which means that even though regardless of what the input to this entire network is, is the output is always going to lie on the manifold represented by this weights matrix. In this case, just the one line. Now, if I have nonlinear activations in this hidden layer, if I don't make it, keep it linear, but if I actually introduce a nonlinearity, then what happens? Then the net performs nonlinear principal component analysis. Instead of just trying to find a linear manifold, the decoder is represents the best nonlinear manifold to fit the data. And if I vary this value y, the output is always going to lie somewhere on this nonlinear curve. So I can make the network, actually that, is, that figure is maybe slightly incorrect. A more appropriate uh, uh, structure is something like this. I can have an encoder, which is a deep network, or it can be an arbitrarily complicated network, resulting in some low dimensional representation. And then I can have another network which takes this low dimensional representation and reconstructs the input. And when I do so, what really would be happening is at this point, you would be the rest of the decoder is going to find, model a nonlinear manifold, and the output of this guy is going to represent a position on this nonlinear manifold. So what is, what is really performing, uh, being what is really being performed is a nonlinear principal component analysis, and deeper networks can capture more complicated manifolds. So these would be deep autoencoders. Uh, here are a couple of examples. In this case, I have two-dimensional input. And I have a network with several layers over here, which goes down to just one value. This is the encoder. And then I have a decoder, which is also several layers. And when I give it this two-dimensional input and try to I learn, optimize this network, here's what it learns. It puts all of the data on these purple dots onto this curve. Ideally, you'd have expected it to learn a spiral. But it's not really learning the spiral. But the interesting thing is the training data ends over here. So when I'm training the network, it's going to learn to put data all the way out to here, up to here. And for the training data, this z value is going to take some range. But then now, I can just take the decoder and give it inputs which are not in the range of training instances that it saw. And if you look at what happens, at this point, it actually sort of becomes a, almost linear and doesn't quite extend into a spiral as you would hope to. So, so you have some constraints, but the fact that it actually seems to be learning a nonlinear manifold sort of shows up. In this case, we're trying to learn a sinusoid, and this has not been properly trained. But you can see that it's structured, it actually learns kind of mostly models the sinusoid. So this is the autoencoder. The autoencoder actually performs principal, nonlinear principal component analysis. And when the hidden representation is of lower dimensionality than the input, we'll often call it a bottleneck net, net network. And this is nonlinear PCA. It learns the manifold of the data if properly trained. And this can be put to good use. So uh, the key portion is that the decoder can only generate data on the manifold that the data lie in. So this also makes it an excellent generator of the distribution of the training data. Any values applied to the hidden input will pr produce outputs that are similar to the training data. This is a feature that is often used in things like variational autoencoders and, and generative uh, adversarial networks. So consider our, uh, our, uh, an autoencoder trained on, on the digits data. So in this case, if I just trained the autoencoder, got rid of the encoder, and just used the decoder. Regardless of what values I fed it, I would expect the output to look somewhat like digits. And uh, here, I'll finish with some examples from sound. Here, here we trained an autoencoder to uh, on examples of recordings from a saxophone. Then you get rid of the encoder, and this is the decoder. And now I'm going to excite the decoder with different patterns of inputs. So here is one uh, example of the uh, pattern that I, uh, of when I excite just one unit. I'm going to get an output which is, I'm, I'm going to get an output sound which sounds like this. <laughs> <laughs> 
just sounds, it's not like a saxophone note, but it sounds somewhat like a sound that a saxophone might make. Here if I excite a different combination of inputs. It's, like, it's not producing white noise, it's not producing random stuff, it's actually producing saxophone notes. So as you can see, it's actually learned the autoencoder, the de has learned the manifold of saxophones. And when I excite the decoder, it only produces saxophone sounds. Here's a different example. This is for clarinets. It's not a single clarinet note again, but the point is it's learned to produce, the decoder is now a dictionary that only produces clarinet-like sounds. And so here's a very cute little application that I can actually use this for. Signal separation. This is one of the things I work on, so you know, it's always fun to work on this. Here the problem is given a mixed sound from multiple sources. I want to separate the sources. So I have some music with different sounds. I want to pull out the individual sounds. So here's how I could use a dictionary-based technique. The basic idea is to learn a dictionary of you know, building blocks which can compose the sounds from each source. So all sources, uh, signals from a specific source are composed from the dictionary for the source. I could learn, for example, a dictionary for guitars, another dictionary for drums. Then when I get a mixed signal, I know the mixed signal is a signal of which, which includes uh, sounds from both the guitar and the drums. All I have to do is to find out how much of the mixed signal came from the guitar, how much of the mixed mix signal could be composed from the drums, and then I could separate the two signals out. So from our setting, using deep neural ne networks, I can train an autoencoder for, say, the first sound source, like the guitar. I can similarly train an autoencoder for the second sound source, say, the drums. And now I only retain the decoders, and the decoders are dictionaries which are only capable of generating sounds from those specific sources, the guitar or the drums. And now I get a mixed signal. The mixed signal includes both guitars and drums. So all I have to do is I train, I flip the usual process of learning inside out, and I say here is a mixed signal, here is the autoencoder which when excited will produce guitar sounds, here is the autoencoder which when excited produces dictionary sounds. These two have been summed up to produce this mixed sound. Find me the inputs to the two dictionary, to the, to the two decoders that would produce this mixed sound. So I'm, I'm actually going to use back propagation to, to determine what these inputs must be such that the output is best explained. So I'd have some mixed sound. I'm going to use back propagation to find out how to excite these two guys. And when I do that, the output of the first, the uh, first uh, decoder, is going to be my best guess for the for, for sounds from the first source. The output of the second decoder is going to be my best guess for the sounds from the second source. And let's take, let's take a look at how this works. So this is. I have two instruments playing over here. Right? And so that actually does a, so the imp impressive bit is that because the network is only able to compose a specific manifold of data, it's actually we, we can take advantage of this to analyze data, analyze the mixed signal and separate it out. And the even more interesting thing here is that the dictionary, the capacity of the dictionary to represent a specific sound source depends on the architecture. So here, these dictionaries are actually quite deep and wide, five layers, 600 units, so maybe even more. So I'll stop right here. I'm quite out of time. For this, you know, the classification networks, uh, forget about classification, this final slide is kind of bogus, I'll stop right here. So I'll take any questions. Yes. <coughs> Bang on time, 12.30. Mm -hmm. I had a question on uh, non-
manifolds captured by the deep learning networks. Uh -huh. So even in traditional machine learning, we have uh, learned these manifold learning methods, for example, matrix factorization with graph regularization constraints, which capture manifold. So uh, uh, do you have any experience about how different is the representations learned by deep learning compared to the other methods? As in, do we have insight into what additional things we are able to capture with these uh, deep layers? So the, the uh, uh, yes and no. And the answer is, you actually seem to, uh, when you learn, when you use more uh, uh, regimented structures like matrix factorization techniques with specific nonlinearities, keep in mind that all of those can actually be thought of as very specific instances as of, of autoencoders. So in that sense, an auto, you know, the only real distinction is that this is a more generic uh, instance of those problems. And the only other thing that changes is that very often when you're doing any of these techniques, you have very standard learning algorithms here. We are just using regularized gradient descent. So, the, so think of these deep networks as a generalization of these standard models, which come with a different class of learning algorithms. And one of the effects of having a different class of learning algorithms is that the, the, the resulting solutions are not directly comparable except in terms of what you can do with them. And it turns out that, the, that in problems like signal separation, signal enhancement, just synthesizing data, whether it be text, images, what have you, net, deep networks are, seem to just be a lot more capable of producing the correct class of outputs as, and as it turns out in something that I've not really talked about, they're also capable of going really horribly wrong, much more so than standard techniques. Okay. I have two questions. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you you use the terms uh, function, engine, and uh, machine when you were talking about MLP. So uh, what is the difference between these terms? And so one more question. Uh, the second part you said deeper networks are expressive. So did you mean deeper networks are more expressive than shallow networks? So because, because every yes. deeper network can, be, can have an equivalent shallow network. So uh, deeper networks for uh, a given number of uh, units, we saw this already, that uh, a shallow networks within a resource restriction, deeper networks can, can, repre can represent more, uh, a greater variety of functions than shallow networks. We already saw that just a single layer, hidden layer, can represent pretty much any function that you can think of. So you can't get more expressive than that. But if I give you a restriction, you know, you have 600 neurons then going deep seems to be uh, give you a greater capacity for modeling uh, complex functions than just having 500 of them in one hidden layer and a single output. So that's what I mean by being more expressive than uh, shallow networks. In that for the same function, a deep network is going to need far fewer neurons than a shallow one. And, in the, and as for the terminology, well, uh, there's a lot of terminology that, that I've used. I think it would be hard for me to begin to go back and unwind and explain what each of those meant. I'm pretty sure when I used the term, it was meant to be, but I can't guarantee that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, you know, there are these people um, who say that machine learning or artificial intelligence nowadays and even more since the advent of deep learning, they call it um, alchemy, or they say it's a black, uh, black box and um, they are a bit hesitant to use it. So I would like to know your opinion on this. How do you see it? Do you see it more as science or a science in progress that we will get to? Uh, there are two sides to this. Uh, I would say, you know, with no disrespect to anybody, for 95% of graduate students, it's alchemy, right? Uh, you, in, in the sense that you have these magic boxes that seem to be, you connect them in the right way, use the right loss function, and it works. And who cares why? And then there's the other 5% who are really worried about why. So my guess is that by and by we will actually learn a lot more about the whys 
there's a lot of interesting work on, on the wires currently, specifically if you look at uh, the work that's uh, on uh, you know how you can uh, on learning adversarial generating adversarial examples and so on the, the people the people working on these problems are really trying to understand what the network is really doing uh, there have been a great many theoreticians who have tried to unravel these there are papers on this all the time but from the perspective of the layperson which includes me we're just happy to use it right if it works great otherwise you try something else okay thank you mm. Thank you. You seem to be nice.